All right, thank you. I would uh, recommend to you to also look at Richard's tweet and then also look at all the answers. And I'm sure those answers reflect what was going on here in the room, an extraordinary amount of agendas. And uh, this, of course, is the problem with the World Health Assembly. This is the problem with global health. Uh, how do we bring all these agendas together? How do we move it forward? What do we select for a briefing like this? And of course, already months ahead of planning, uh, Michaela told, where is she? Here? Yes, there she is. And her team uh, do all the preparatory work and reach out uh, to speakers and plan together with the UN Foundation how to take this event forward. John, some welcome words from you. Thank you, Alona. Uh, I'm John Lang, uh, uh, retired US ambassador and the senior fellow for global health diplomacy at the United Nations Foundation. Uh, this is the 20th year of the United Nations Foundation, the 10th year of the Global Center uh, here at the Graduate Institute, and the fifth year for this introduction to WHA, a briefing for delegates. Uh, when we created this five years ago, Alona and I really wanted to bring up together a forum the day before WHA begins to inform and enlighten and to really improve the level of discussion and debate that will take place in the week following this event at the World Health Assembly itself. It's always a difficult issue for us to uh, pick the issues to be highlighted, but we certainly wanted to uh, do that uh, this year by bringing together, first and foremost, the transformation of WHO, this uh, major effort that's going on, and you'll hear more about that in a bit. And then we decided to look at what was really at stake in the debates that will be going on at WHO. Uh, there are many issues we could have picked. Uh, there's a new strategy for polio eradication. There will be discussions of the nexus among uh, climate and energy and health and many, many other issues. But what we did was pick th some of those that we think will be most salient at this uh, assembly and we'll be discussing those later in the program. We're delighted you're here and we hope that everyone will leave this event in three hours uh, much better informed than the, uh, you are at this point. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, John, and truly a pleasure to work with you and the Foundation to take this forward. Uh, just some general things. We have uh, an introduction, we have a panel, we then have a whole series of briefings. You have all that in the program that you've been able to pick up. We usually don't spend much time introducing the speakers because we've given you a speaker's booklet where you can follow that through, and of course, all of you uh, if you want to know even more about the speakers, we'll uh, find them on the internet. Uh, I've been asked to give uh, a few introductory remarks as to what's at stake. And John already mentioned uh, our 10th year anniversary. For that anniversary, in cooperation with the BMJ, we produced this uh, uh, special issue of the Journal on Global Health Disruptors, and we try to look back 10 years, what were the major disruptors, and also look forward 10 years. And I hope you will have an opportunity to also look at that and take it with you. It's, of course, also available electronically, but there are issues uh, uh, that are available outside. What uh, I wanted to do is to pick up particularly on an issue that's also raised in that uh, journal, and that is really the political dimension of what we do. And I find the longer I am in global health, and you don't want to know how long, uh, the more this political dimension, the political de determinants of health come to the fore for me. And I think in the present political environment that is probably even more obvious than it might have been five or 10 years ago. But maybe because we weren't that politically aware five or 10 years ago, maybe also that's why some of the issues have reached the stage that they have reached 
where there's practically no issue in global health that you can raise without using the term crises or emergency. And that, I think, is of really great concern. As I drove here today, or I should say, as I was driven here today by my husband, uh, I was reading an article in The New Yorker, and it says clearly, vaccination is a political issue. And uh, I'd really like to underline that and highlight how our discussion on global health needs to constantly, whatever issue we are addressing, ask this question about the politics of that issue and how it intersects. And I just want to raise a couple of issues where I think what I call the political determinants of health, the commercial determinants of health, and increasingly, maybe we need to call it that, I don't know, the digital determinants of health intersect. And as these issues intersect, and that's why I did that little Richard Horton exercise when we started, the question really is, if there is so much at stake in global health, and I might add so much at stake for WHO, how do we create a common agenda? How do we really create a common agenda, one, two, or three things that we drive forward that we feel are absolutely essential? There are bits and pieces of that, and for many of us, the UHC agenda offers that opportunity, but uh, probably it's bigger, it's wider, and more complicated, as many people speak you know, about the wicked problems that we face in our societies. Let me raise a, a couple of points. First, again, on vaccines. Uh, again, in this uh, New Yorker article, it says very clearly, to vaccinate or not to vaccinate are political acts. And uh, some of you might have seen some of the recent research uh, done that uh, shows a clear correlation, at least in our part of the world, between the anti-vax movements and populism. Where populism goes up, anti-vaccination goes up. And these are issues that uh, we have to be aware of uh, much more closely because also the issue at stake here in my mind is not just about vaccination. It's about whether in our societies we uphold or we negate the social contract. To vaccinate is a social contract. I do this not only for me, I do this for my family, for my society, for my neighborhood, and in the end, you know, for the whole world. And here already you have that interface also between the digital determinants, because again, some recent research shows us, uh, analyzing Facebook, that very tiny clusters of anti-vax um, uh, messages and tweets have a clear disproportional reach. So something is going on here that we need to be much more aware of in terms of the political developments. Second, there are much larger issues, political issues of trust and public health measures. And it's been very obvious also in the Ebola outbreak in DRC and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to Vin Kim Nguyen. Vin Kim, I saw you are here. Where are you? There he is. Vin Kim, who has just come back from there and has written uh, a brilliant piece about the issues around community trust. He will succeed me as the director of the Global Health Center as of 1st of September, so I hope that uh, many of you will have the opportunity to meet him. But uh, what's interesting, both in the situation in DRC, we've also seen a similar lack of community trust in relation to the last mile of polio. And you know that uh, polio immunization has been suspended in some countries exactly for this reason. And there's something going on there, again, in relation, in this case, perhaps, to the global social contract. 
because one of the issues that's coming to the fore is that people in the community are asking, why are you here for polio? Why are you here for Ebola? Why weren't you here when my kid had malaria? Why is there no primary health care center here? So again, something's going on there that we need to be aware of. And that, of course, leads us into the very, very, very important issue of the high-level meeting this year at the United Nations at, uh, on universal health coverage. We will see whether a breakthrough is possible. But if we look at the negotiations in Astana on primary health care, if we look at the positions taken in New York at the Security Council, in relation to the resolution on rape and conflict, uh, we can see that these are going to be very difficult negotiations. Difficult negotiations because some countries do not see UHC as a social contract. The asks of UHC 2030 have made it very clear that it is. But also, aside from that larger issue, the issue of gender equity, the issue of sexual and reproductive health and rights is also one that is starting to actually push back the UHC and the primary health care agenda. And that is a big issue that uh, we need to keep in mind. Fourth, and I can't say much about that due to time, but if we look at the political and commercial determinants in their intersection, we sort of need to look at the prevention of NCDs, we need to look at access to medicines, issues again that are on the agenda of the World Health Assembly. But even here, if we look behind the scenes and uh, we look at who is bankrolling certain think tanks who give counter health messages, but also bankrolling uh, political movements who are giving counter-health messages. A number of the political populist movements in Europe are paid by the tobacco industry, and you can see them taking back tobacco uh, legislation. And fifth, of course, very important, and uh, I'm sure it'll come up in our discussion, the politics of climate emergency and everything that flows from that. I just want to leave one message with you, and while we all push for different agendas where we all try to somehow pull them together in a larger global health agenda, I think we all need to work on one thing, and that is to strengthen and protect WHO. It is not matter of fact. Irrespective, and I'm sure Peter Singh will come back to that, irrespective of what WHO delivers, there are forces out there who do not want to strengthen and support WHO. And therefore, it needs you to strengthen and support WHO. And again, I'd like to come back to Twitter with two messages. One was Anthony Costello, who said, following uh, Richard Horton's challenge, I want to hear only one thing, that member states fill the current urgent critical financial gap of 54 million to tackle Ebola. So walk the talk, as we said today. And the other is by Key Park, who said, I want to see WH member states fully fund the WHO without earmarks. And uh, one of our panelists today, and we'll come back to that, recently said at a partners meeting that if anything is politically needed at this point, it's an increase, a significant increase, possibly a doubling of the WHO assess contributions. So my plea to you is fight for your issue. It'll be close to your heart. You're emotional about it. You want to push it through politically, but also fight for the larger agendas, fight for the global social contract, and fight for WHO. Thank you. All right, uh, based on uh, these issues that I've raised and linking that agenda to the transformation of the WHO, I'd like to invite our panelists. Oh, Shanduka first, sorry, my mistake. Shanduka, please. Uh, I should look at my program now then. Okay, 
So uh, I'd like to welcome Gianluca Burci, who uh, is here with us at the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute, who was the former legal counsel of the WHO, hardly a person except perhaps the present legal counsel who knows as much about WHO as he does. And uh, he will say a few words about WHO procedures and governance for those of you that are not so familiar with them. Gianluca, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ilona, and uh, welcome to this afternoon. First of all, I apologize for my voice, but I have a horrible cold. My nose stopped working a few days ago, and it has resumed functions yet, so, but I hope I'll be understandable. So I would like to uh, briefly give a bit of, a, of the basics about what you can expect if you go to the WHA during this week. Uh, there may be some veterans in the audience that have gone through several health assemblies, but from the average age that I see in front of me, I guess that's not the case. So if you're there for the first time as interns, as NGO, as young delegates, the WHA can be a fairly uh, frustrating and bewildering uh, event because everything is hectic, rushed, congested. And if you don't understand a bit what's going on, you're at the receiving end of this. Instead, I think you need to have the tools uh, to fully navigate uh, what you have to do and, and, and to make the most of it. Okay, so I'm going to quickly cover this, these four points. Basically, what is the assembly about? The first is who participates? The people that you will see running around like crazy during the next week, who are they? What are they doing? What are their rights? What is the position? So first of all, obviously, the uh, member states are front row center. It is an intergovernmental organization with 194 member states. Uh, and uh, ministers of health often come, but they stay only for a few days. Then they leave, delegation can relax, but the work still goes on. What is important is that you get ministers of health from Nauru, from Tuvalu, from countries where it take a week to get to Geneva, but they make the effort to come here. And that's not just because they like to fly, because the multilateral uh, diplomacy has importance, because they want to be there, they want to bring the message, because they do build alliance and networks. So uh, I think it's, it's uh, really encouraging to see the level of participation, also from, from countries that logistically are very challenged. You will see also, if you look around the room, uh, some countries, in particular least developed and so on, they have two, three people. They really have to make the most of what they have for a week. Other delegations are up to 50 people. So the power differential is enormous uh, in terms of ability to participate and ability to really uh, make a difference in terms of uh, discussions, decisions, and so on. Then, uh, very quickly, I don't want to stop too much on that, you will have intergovernmental organizations, in particular the European Union, there is a bit of a differential treatment because unlike other international organizations, they are normally allowed to participate in negotiations, in drafting groups, uh, because of the transfer of competence to, uh, to the common institution. So they, they stand out a little bit. Yet then you have Palestine, you have observers, and you have the public and the media. And uh, sometimes in the, the discussion is, uh, is there always an, an obligation to let the media and the public in? These are public meetings, so there is an interest in having them open. At the same time, now we have all the meetings or the public meetings are webcasted. So you can look at them from your bed if you want. So it's good to be there for many reasons, but the, the urge to let everybody in has decreased, I think. In terms of participation, I think the most important part is this one, is what we now call non-state actors, that before we used just to call NGOs. So uh, three years ago, the Assembly adopted this framework of uh, engagement with non-state actors. The, the first main uh, global policy on engagement with non-state actors across the UN system. And that's introduced uh, a number of new actors. For example, International Business Association, the first used to be lumped together with NGOs, and in particular, Philanthropic Foundation, first and foremost, the Gates Foundation. So all these uh, actors can then can participate in the executive board and in the health assembly. And the, um, what rights of participation do they have? And if you're in NGOs, of course, that's something of importance to you because you're not just going there to sit around. You, you, you want to have a, uh, an impact on what is being discussed. Fundamentally, you make statements um, in, the, in the formal procedure. 
And uh, this is a work in progress. If you look at the documents for this Health Assembly and for the board, you will see that there is a lot of discussion about changing a bit the relations with NGOs and other non-state actors. For example, allowing them to speak not just at the end, when everything has been decided and it's a bit moot and people get bored of 20 statements from NGOs, but to try to bring them up front, to have the statements before decisions are taken, uh, so that the civil society and other interests can, can play a better role. So look at the documents, because there is quite uh, some discussion on finding different packages of, uh, of cooperation and, and so on. Obviously, if you're an NGO, you want to be here not just to make a statement, but because you want to lobby, you want to influence delegation, you want to brief delegation. NGOs have a tremendous impact on capacity building. For small delegations, they don't have the time or the resources to go through all the items. NGOs can really bring a lot of support. So the physical presence does make a big difference, whether or not you can deliver your statement. You can be, you can be there. So what is discussed? You look at the agenda and you wonder why are these items in the agenda to begin with? How did they get there? Why these are not others? Why some are recurring and some, some, other, some are not? So here I, I, can, I, I can only oversimplify. First of all, in procedural terms, the agenda of the assembly is prepared, is sealed more or less by the executive board in January. And then on Monday morning, it goes through what we call the general committee, which is like the bureau of the assembly. And normally the general committee doesn't touch much, but it can decide on the order of items or move one to, from one committee to the next. So it has a, an impact on the program of work. So if you look at the, at the items, there are fundamentally four categories. Some are new items, proposed by member states or director general. They go through the board and sometimes they come to the assembly with a uh, draft resolution or draft decisions. So if you see it at the, at the end of the document, it's to facilitate the work of the assembly. And that's the role of the board. The second are all the items that keep coming back because there are reporting requirements. The assembly asked the director general, please report back in two years. And that's the subject of a lot of discussion because there's a lot of inertia and you have the same items come back over and over and over again. And the agenda is so packed, it's so congested, and the session is so short that again, at this particular health assembly, look at the document and you will see that there is quite the momentum to try to simplify and rationalize this part, to have uh, less reporting requirements, maybe report back in five years, not next year, consolidate things together. So if this decision goes through and you come back next year, you may see a different agenda, slimmer, more focused, more strategic. And then there are sometimes supplementary items. States can come straight to the health assembly without going through the board. And that sometimes is, is problematic. Plus progress reports, uh, that seems like, you know, just progress information, but they elicit a lot of comments because of the important things for delegation. And so uh, they are discussed only at the health assembly and not at the executive board. So for many NGOs, these are also important items, not just what's up to a decision, but it's also the progress reports. Again, what I said, the uh, governance, multilateral governance is a bit messy, always. Uh, there is a tension between trying to make things focused and strategic on the one hand, but on the other hand, there is an interest of delegation to keep their options open if they have a decision, if they want to push an item and so on. So this goes on and on and on. It's part of the, the reform of WHO, it's still a work in progress. But as I said, there are some important decisions that may be taken at this health assembly uh, to, to rationalize things. So how does the assembly work? Um, again, the, um, it's a short session, probably it's the shortest in the UN system. Uh, it's also an, an annual session. There are organizations that have sessions every two years, every four years. WHO has it every year, but it's very, very short, very compressed. So again, things are very, are very high hectic, and it'd be confusing and challenging, in particular for small delegations. You have five, six meetings in parallel, and you cannot be at everybody. You have to prioritize, to strategize, to work with, with other countries, to try to uh, keep informed, and so on. If you are registered for the Health Assembly, the Secretariat has uh, prepared the WHA app that you can download on your mobile and that gives you information in real time what is going where. These are the small practical arrangements that make a huge difference because, again, you know where you have to be in real time and that makes a big difference in particular for small delegations. So who are the guys that are presiding on the, on the Health Assembly? You see them up on the podium, you see them giving the floor. So I don't go through the numbers, but the, the main point I want to make 
is that the, the, the offices of the Health Assembly are all decided on a regional basis. There is like an accepted formula of rotations among regions, so the power of choosing the people rests very much with the regions. And if, you, if you've gone already to the Health Assembly, you know how crucial it is to have a good chair. A good chair can make an incredible difference, a bad chair can be a disaster. So being a good chair is an art, but it's also capacity building. And the secretary sits with incoming chair to try to, be, to brief them on the agenda, to go through procedural uh, obstacles and so on. But again, if you sit in meetings, you will see what I mean. How is the work uh, divided up? So the, uh, we, we have the plenary, very august in the big uh, assembly hall, uh, but that's not where the action is. The assembly has like a general debate, uh, elects a member of the executive board, but then adopts the decisions at the end of the session. The real work goes on in the main committees. And these are committee A and committee B. And let me move to that. So you have the plenary, you have the credentials committee. I won't spend time on that. I already spoke about the general committee. So the main action is shared between the two main committees. Committee A is normally the busiest, and it is the committee that deals with programmatic issues, including the budget. The budget is not a financial issue, it's a program issue. So you can imagine how busy it will be this year with Dr. Terido's proposal about the program budget. Committee B is administrative, financial, legal items, and traditionally it, it consists of the item on uh, health conditions in the occupied Palestinian territory. An important point is that governance and reform is discussed in Committee B. So if that's what you are following, you want to be there. Being, since the two committees have different workloads, sometimes items are shifted from Committee A to Committee B. And so if you don't know that that's happening, you may be sitting like a, like a sitting duck in Committee A, and the same item is discussed in Committee B. They're very frustrating. So the WHA app is very helpful in, in that connection. So Committee B normally starts on Wednesday. And people ask, so why are you waiting so long? That's because only two formal meetings can take place at the same time. And that's done not to penalize too much small delegations. So as long as the plenary is in session, there cannot be the two committee running in parallel. So you have to, to wait until the adjournment of the plenary, and then you convene committee B. At the same time, there are many informal consultations and drafting committee that work on draft resolution, draft decisions, and so on. So they are not official meeting, but they multiply the challenges of small delegation. They, they take place at the same time, they go up the, in the middle of the night, high drama until the last moment, and that's where the negotiations take place. There are also technical briefings and side events. If you look at the Journal of the Assembly, there are up to six side events every day, organized by member states. There's a fierce competition to get a slot for a side event. Ministers come, even prime ministers come. Sometimes there's a higher representation there than in the main meetings of the Health Assembly. So because states want to bring the message directly and not necessarily in, in a multilateral uh, discussion. So that's very important. And then, as I think it came out clearly from what Ilona said, the WHA is Global Health Week. There's a tons of things going on inside the Palais and outside the Palais. And that's so important because everybody converges on Geneva, networking, a lot of new messages, a lot of new initiatives. So that's a, big, a very important part of what will happen next week. It can be distracting because some people go to the meeting at the Intercontinental Hotel and don't stay in the Palais. But that's a price to pay for the political importance of global health. Finally, oopsie. Okay, two minutes. How decisions are taken? You are here not just to, uh, to, to talk, but to take decisions as member states. So the... Uh, there are the draft resolution and decisions coming from the board or directly from member states. And in the past, there was a lot of discontent about tactical resolutions introduced at the last moment, and everybody was upset, and so on. Now, a proposal can be put to the floor only until Monday evening. So you, on Tuesday morning, you will have all the conference papers and no surprises. That's what you will discuss and what you're supposed to decide during that week. Then discussions take place over the whole week. Again, there is a formal uh, 
procedure uh, for every item, a discussion and so on, but it's a lot of side discussion, drafting committees, even coffee shop meetings. People go out and they try to sort it out at the coffee shop, sometimes more effectively than sitting in a crowded conference room. So there's a lot of action around this. And then finally, the, uh, the decisions and the resolution that are adopted in the committees, and then they are brought to the assembly, to the plenary. On the last day, bang, 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 the, the, the president gavels in the final decisions. What happens, and I hope it will not happen this time, is there are some delegations that are very unhappy with what happened in the committee. They threaten to reopen the item in plenary. And that's very disruptive because it's a big room, difficult to negotiate, maybe a few delegations are there. Normally it doesn't happen, but sometimes there are, there are rumblings that that may happen. One point that if you are a WHO veteran, you will know, but you will find kind of dubious, is that sometimes the chairman proposes something. Can I take it that you agree A, B, C, D? I see no objection, it is so decided. So that's a, a decision. But that decision is not reflected in a formal resolution and so on. And so how do you find it? You need to go back to the summary records months later and try to find the decision. Sometimes it's practical because you don't waste time preparing a new document and maybe it's reopened, renegotiated. But we have criticism that that's not very transparent because these are decisions, sometimes substantive decisions, and they're not immediately available unless you know where to look. And they come back to haunt us sometimes. Finally, one thing you will find in WHO is an absolute dogma or consensus. There should be no voting. Consensus, basically decision without a formal vote. Yes, no, in uh, abstention. And so that makes negotiation all the more important because you need to, to reach an outcome where everybody maybe is not terribly happy but not terribly unhappy. So negotiations are all the more important. The formal votes are only when you have elections, director general every five years, the external auditor every four years, I believe, and only on Palestine because obviously there is no consensus on, on that item. Otherwise, also as, as, as delegates, as NGOs and so on, you also want to work towards uh, not disrupting consensus, but achieving consensus, because that's the way uh, multilateral health diplomacy works. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, uh, later on. Okay. Thank you very much, Gianluca. Gianluca didn't mention uh, one meeting place this time where actually a lot of decisions are taken and a lot of health diplomacy takes place, which is the Serpent Bar, obviously. And uh, I know some of you have explicit strategies how you use the Serpent Bar to trip over people, challenge people, and try and convince them. So obviously, as important as all this formal process is, Playing the informal process, and in that sense also the political game, is very, very important. It's my great pleasure now to ask uh, the members of our panel discussion to please come up. Uh, we thought it would be helpful to discuss transforming the WHO, what's happening, what are the implications. I'd like to ask Peter Singer to please come up, who is Assistant Director General at the WHO, uh, Anna's Nordström, who is Ambassador for Global Health at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Sweden, the very happy that Ambassador Socorro Flores Liera of Mexico is uh, here with us, a member of the Executive Board, Chris Elias, the President of Global Development Program at the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, and of course, last but not least, Mareike Hase, who uh, is with Bread for the World, Brot für die Welt, uh, who will represent uh, civil society on this panel. So what we would like to do is get uh, commentaries from all of you in relation to the transformation process at the WHO, how it happened, how far it's advanced, how it should continue, what its outcome should be, even though you know, with a learning organization there's never a final outcome. But Peter, if you permit, I'd like to start with you because definitely you've been involved actually in a number of parallel and intersecting transformation processes at the WHO. What does this actually stand for? You know, we say transformation. Of course, in the SDGs, we also say transformation. 
but what does WHO mean when it says transformation, and what has it already done? Thank you, uh, Ilona, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, let me just answer that question in one word, which is impact. What it means is creating an organization that's fit for purpose to achieve impact. And when we say impact, of course, we mean driving the health-related SDGs. So that's what it's for. I think, uh, I think what I could do fruitfully is very briefly to describe what it is, because colleagues will then be reacting evaluatively about how they see it unfolding. But I think if I describe what it is, that's what will be most helpful for people. And by the way, just to introduce myself, I'm at Peter A. Singer. And I uh, would look forward to interacting with all of you, not just in the next two minutes, but uh, thereafter as well. Um, so uh, the transformation really is uh, five things, or it has five elements. Firstly, it's the strategy. And the strategy is called the General Program of Work. General Program of Work 13 was the first, uh, was the program of work under Dr. Tedros, approved a year ago. And its essence is uh, impact for people at the country level. It has the triple billion target, a billion more people with universal health coverage, billion people better protected from health emergencies, billion people living healthier lives, which is the multi-sectoral health promotion uh, billion. It has the vision of WHO, which it just took from Article One of the Constitution, highest attainable standard of health, and the mission of uh, promoting health, keeping the world safe, serving the vulnerable. So first element of the transformation is a strategy. Second element is uh, revising the processes. 13 processes were re-engineered. And uh, in particular, let me just use the example of the program budget that uh, John Luca mentioned. The program budget's a major implementation piece for the strategy. And that is now much more granular in the sense that there was a process around global goods, inventorying them, uh, measuring them, so they're uh, based on country needs, and there was a process around country support plans. So uh, strategy, process re-engineering, third part is the operating model. And the operating model means not just the organogram, which was revised to include programs, emergencies, and then the supporting things like governance and, uh, and administration, but also enabling functions like science and data, uh, but also agility, so how those groups all work together. So strategy, process, operating model. Fourth is culture, and a values charter was uh, recently endorsed and released, but more importantly, engaged by the whole organization. And then finally, partnerships, and this brings us back to uh, the point, Alona, you made at the beginning, which is everyone in the room here. WHO is taking a, a more open uh, approach to uh, uh, partnerships um, whilst respecting uh, FENSA. It's obvious that uh, uh, young people, and did you really think the audience was that young, John Luca? Yeah? Uh, raise your hand if you're young. <laughs> okay, so you were right. We are all young at Peter A. Singer. So uh, for... <laughs> for young people like yourselves, um, uh, but uh, this is where um, you all come in, uh, in terms of a new approach to partnership. So in summary, transforming for impact, so the organization's fit for purpose, strategy, processes, operating model, culture, partnerships, that's really what the transformation is, and of course the leadership that's needed by Dr. Tedros and leaders throughout the organization to actually make that happen. Thank you, and we might come back later to this notion of leadership, what it means and, uh, and how it is uh, exerted. I'd like to go to the two member states now that are here, Mexico and Sweden. Uh, if uh, you allow, Ambassador, could you uh, share with us how, do, uh, how have countries experienced this change? Uh, and uh, particularly also if you know, we go to the WHO constitution, the constitution of course says WHO is both the member states and the secretariat. So how do you see that interface? How do member states support this transformation? Maybe uh, critically uh, 
uh, watch it? Uh, how involved are they? What can you say, first of all, for your country and perhaps also the responses of the executive board? Do you think WHO is on the right track or is it moving too slow or what's happening? Well, thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all. It's, I'm always glad to be here on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> but anyway, I'm very glad to see such a full auditorium and I'm very glad that it's full of young people because you will have to continue this work in, in the future. So just, just, just let me say, I think we started, you started, Ilona, saying several very important things. We are deeply changing in the world. I think it's very clear that we are experiencing a very important change in, at all international fora, in all countries, and I think it's important that we all keep transforming. Otherwise, uh, what we are going to see is that international organizations are far apart from people, and people do not see the importance of the international organization arena. So, um, and I think it's important to keep this change and this transformation, but of course we have to know in this transformation where do we want to achieve? And I think that is, that is very, very relevant. We approve in the framework of the United Nations the SDGs. And the SDGs that we all understand as the Agenda 2030 are telling us very clearly where we need as an international community, but also as member states, where we need to go to ensure that we are going to achieve sustainable development. And the most important part is that nobody is left behind. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is the edges of the, 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 stick, the transformation slogan. I think it's very important what Peter said. It's the triple billion. We need to have an impact on the people. And we have to have more people with access to health coverage. We need to have more attention to emergencies. And, and certainly, this requires a new vision of WHO. And this is what, the, what, what uh, Dr. Tedros is, is doing. How the, the member states, particularly in, in the executive board, are looking at this, of course they are very interested. I think we all, as member states, recognize that there is a need to transform, that there is a need to be more efficient, that there is a big competition of resources all over the world, and that if we want to have an impact, we need to work hard. And this is why the vision that was presented was, was welcomed by, by all states, but it's not only the transformation, I think, it's not only where do we want to go, but how and when. And this is a, a work ongoing, because we cannot forget, for example, that the WHO has a very important normative role. And that normative role is helping many of the member states to establish their own health policies. And, as, and, and this is something that we cannot lose. WHO needs to be a normative body, of course, and we have to take into account governance. At the same time, there are some areas where we certainly need to focus to ensure that this big transformation is very successful. And this has to take into account transparency. We need to be very transparent. We need to have accountability. And this is, I think, where we all are working. Uh, the Secretariat, uh, the Director General, has presented a very important uh, uh, program of work, it has been approved, but of course we are not working in the details. How are we going to put in practice that? And something important as well that has been presented is, how are we going to start uh, improving the working relations at the national level, at the regional level, and of course within the secretariat? So um, I think uh, to, to answer very, very uh, concretely, Mexico welcomes this initiative. We think it's very important. At the same time, we absolutely need to ensure that the role of the WHO is, as a normative body is fully kept and that this transformation is going to be uh, uh, very transparent and there will have accountability. And of course, I have to say something also very positive of the work that has been done, that is the gender parity. I think that Dr. Tedros has worked a lot uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, gender parity in the WHO, something that we very much welcome is there. I think this is, this is uh, something that we all have to, 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 to be happy with. But at the same time, there is another area, it's not only gender parity, but it's also zero tolerance to harassment in, in any kind. And I think countries like Mexico, working with others, want to ensure that this zero tolerance policy in the, uh, in the UN in general and in WHO is really uh, uh, concretized in practice. And to do that, you, you need to have 
another way to approach to, to, to the zero tolerance to ensure accountability and, of course, to have enough uh, budgetary resources. So these are areas where Mexico finds a lot of, of priority and, and that we will continue to work on supporting uh, uh, the, the, this transformation within the WHO. So I stop here. So I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you, of course, also for highlighting the, uh, the gender issues and uh, the zero tolerance uh, element we've seen over the last uh, couple of years, some very unfortunate happenings within the UN and the humanitarian system, both in relation uh, of staff, but also in relation to the people one works with and who one should be serving. And I think those are absolutely critical issues that uh, leadership needs to take on. Anders, I'd like to turn to you. Sweden, of course, recently uh, invited to a partners meeting to actually say how can we uh, jointly as partners of WHO take this agenda forward. I was able to be there for part of it and my understanding was it was actually trying to do a number of things. It wasn't, you know, sort of old-fashioned type of let's fundraise meeting, but also a meeting of a dialogue to understand better what WHO is doing, what uh, member states are expecting, what political support is needed to move agendas forward. Could you tell us a little bit why uh, Sweden wanted to have this meeting, what you think uh, the outcome was, and how it... Uh, looked at this transformation and uh, what's the advice to WHO in taking the transformation forward? Thank you very much. Um, I wouldn't say it was so much that Sweden wanted to have the meeting, it was more WHO asking us to do it and then of course we, we were very happy to do it because uh, both global health and WHO is our, one of our top priorities from the government and especially then if you work on global health as I do as an ambassador for global health, WHO is the most important of course, so we were delighted to do that. Um, I think the transformation agenda is both about in some way an external dimension in terms of how are we changing the response to a different global setting different global health needs. And then there is an internal dimension which has to do with WHO as an organization and Peter described what are the elements of this so-called transformation agenda. And I think in Stockholm we discussed both. Uh, we discussed both about that the world is changing, has changed from the MDGs to now to the Agenda 2030, the SDGs, uh, as my, my colleague here was referring to. And there is a big difference there in terms of then not just now longer working on survival, maternal and child health, um, on the communal diseases, but now having an SDG 3, which is about ensuring that people can live long and healthy lives. And I'm delighted that the GPWs, uh, WHO's WH, overarching goal is actually this, to ensure that people can live long and healthy lives, and we're going to measure this by measuring healthy life expectancy. Um, so I think this is a big transformation. The question is what are the implications then for the organization? Because now, suddenly, it's no longer about only working on the communal diseases. I mean, the NCDs are even more of a bigger challenge. But it's more importantly not only about working with the health sector. This is about how do we reach out to the urban planners? How can we have possibilities for physical activities? How can we have playgrounds for our children? How can we have a food industry that is producing healthy food? I just saw that the Director General met with the food industry just some weeks ago. Brilliant. We need to ensure that we get healthy food for people. But this is a totally different agenda. And the transformation agenda is now built on the strategy Peter was referring to, the three billions. And I think WHO today have got, and we have got quite a good strategy in terms of the first billion universal health coverage. Also for the second billion in terms of a more safe world. But the third billion in terms of more healthy populations, I'm not sure we got that strategy right. From a Swedish point of view, we have actually adopted those three priorities when we have developed our plan now for global health, basically copying from WHO. But again, the billion that we need to do more work on, that is how do we ensure that we get societies that can actually enable people to make more healthy choices for more healthy populations. What are then the implications for WHO? I think they are huge, because WHO is an organization, Elona, you were referring to immunization and Ebola. I can tell you we actually now, we are, we are contributing four of the uh, billion, millions now from the Swedish side. So four million US dollars for the 54 pledged from Sweden or committed from Sweden was announced in Brussels last week. 
but WHO is very good at that and got good competence on immunization, disease controls, but when it comes to healthy populations, do we have WHO staff there? No. So, I mean, this whole transformation agenda is both a substantive one, but it's also very much of a technical one to ensure we have the right kind of technical people, advisors. In Mexico, you don't need a lot of WHO staff, but possibly top-notch technical advisor in terms of how to tackle the enormous obesity epidemic you have in, in Mexico today, uh, because most of the people, of course, you have, but to be able to bring in international expertise. So the WHO business model needs to be different in different country contexts, which actually the GPW says. But I'm delighted with what Peter said, the transformation agenda contain, consists of today, but how do we get even more stronger, strategic, agile, country engagement. WHO is important for Sweden. We are listening to when, Swe when WHO says that children need more physical activity. That was top news in Swedish newspaper. Sweden, WHO is listening. I'm sure the same is for Mexico. But to be more improving than the quality of the work of WHO, the relevance, but also the quality. There is still quite a lot of work to be done in terms of the transformation agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anders, and uh, you've raised, of course, uh, a number of, you know, this constructive criticism, if I, I can say, you know, push the organization, but as you push it, support it uh, as it tries to move in these new areas. And uh, you've also said, both in relation to the SDGs and WHO uh, specifically, how it's about an even larger transformation if this whole area of healthy populations is taken very seriously. And uh, I think it's, uh, I was so pleased when the new uh, uh, division was developed, uh, when you know issues like social determinants of health and health promotion are back on the agenda. But as you said, you know, there's not enough staffing, not enough money and uh, there needs to be an increasing amount of expertise that's developed here. And one might say, in relation to both of you as member states, we have seen in the past, you know, I worked in health promotion for a long time, that the ministries of health weren't too pleased if we moved uh, to other ministries and uh, started also working with them. So there is this question of, you know, how much interaction on these issues is there in the country that WHO can also build on and relate to and, uh, and move forward. Maraki, let me move to you. Civil society, of course, always watches closely, gives a lot of suggestions also how WHO should move forward, wants uh, significantly more transparency, and uh, is worried about some elements maybe of the transformation uh, so, uh, could you share with us what uh, your concerns are, but also what do you think uh, some things have happened that are actually aren't that bad? <laughs> Thank you, Ilona. <laughs> Thank you, uh, first of all, for the invitation, of course. Um, I'm usually sitting on the other side uh, of this room, so I'm happy to be able to um, contribute today to this, to this panel also. Um, let me say just two sentences about uh, Bread for the World, um, just to, that you know what the context is I'm, I'm speaking uh, of. So we are um, the um, agency of the Protestant uh, churches in, in Germany, um, responsible for development and relief work. And uh, we are working with many civil society organizations all over the world on health and also on a variety of other topics, which are mainly linked to health, be it climate justice or trade justice, food security. So there's a, a broader lens on, on the health uh, subject. Um, so, and um, as I said, working closely together with many civil society organizations and one civil society network we are closely working with is uh, the Geneva-based uh, civil society network Geneva Global Health Hub. And um, our aim is also to provide here in Geneva a democratic space for civil society to exchange and strategize on, on global health. So, and in this sense, we also conduct civil society meetings always ahead of the EB meetings and also WHA. And this is also what we did during the last two days, basically. So we had very intense debates on uh, aspects of the WHA agenda and also related to the uh, transformation 
process, of course. So I will gladly also reflect on what we debated there. Um, first of all, I, I also would like to express uh, that it's very welcomed that through the transformation agenda, WHO has initiated changes uh, to address challenges um, that have emerged in recent years. So, of course, we welcome very much this push for a change that is currently happening. So, and, and I think there can be seen a various uh, opportunities for making WHO fit for its purpose, which is, uh, in our understanding, mainly to fulfill its core mandate, to set standards and norms for global health and to better coordinate global health actors or actions. Um, and I would like to elaborate on two um, opportunities further we see, or I see. It. Um, one is to bring financial stability to WHO, and the other one is to improve the engagement with the so-called non-state actors. Um, as it was said before already, there's a very strong need that uh, WHO becomes independent from donations, and, and I also think less donor-driven. As most in the, in the room for sure know, today only 20% of WHO's budget uh, comes from guaranteed assessed contributions by member states. It is 80% that come from voluntary contributions, which are mainly tied to single program lines from only a very few number of donors. And experience shows that this also led to a dramatic underfunding of working areas which might not be so attractive, maybe, such as social determinants of health, as you said before already. In its uh, transformation agenda, WHO aims at overcoming this. Um, this is underlined also by a recently released investment case model. And to me, it's worrying that WHO has actually to sell its work to the world market instead of presenting itself as a joint intergovernmental actor with a common responsibility for global health, global, global public health. I mean, this investment case model, it's an um, economic instrument that calculates how much needs to be invested to reach the triple billion targets in the GPW. And... Um, I mean, I say all this in the full awareness that the entire UN system faces a financial crisis as a symptom of the current hostile atmosphere also with regard to multilateralism. So I, I think an emphasis needs to put stronger, and it has been put already today, um, on member states there's a need to increase assess contributions for strengthening an independent role of WHO and also for multilateralism overall. And as the increase of assessed contributions has been a very long negotiation process already during the last years, in the short term it might also be feasible um, to, of course, increase voluntary anti contributions by member states. And uh, I also like to shortly speak about the engagement of WHO with the so-called non-state actors. It is clearly uh, noticed that DG Tedros is very openly approaching actors from civil society and also other sectors in line with the current um, partnership paradigm. And um, I think it is much needed to put a very solid and democratic governance structure here in place um, within WHO that actually enables on one hand a meaningful participation of, of civil society and on the other hand at the same time preventing conflicts of interest and uh, undue influence on WHO. So in this context we have been speaking already about the FENSA framework on the engagement with non-state actors. There's going to be an evaluation process during this year and I think that's an opportunity to strengthen parts of it. And I just uh, two minutes or uh, one no. minute, uh, <laughs> Half a minute just to say this because i think it's a very important process which is also affecting um, many of us here in the room i say this all in the context of a recent uh, proposal that has been made to restructure the way how non-state actors can actually participate in the governing body meetings so eb and uh, wha meetings and um, we think it's very necessary to have an open public debate on this and so that at the end uh, member states and WHO can make informed decisions on how to strengthen actually the, the voice of civil society because we think there's some aspects inside here which might rather lead to the further limitation of civil society. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Maraka. Thank you. 
So very important points raised, again, about you know, particularly the social justice and normative function of WHO, the transparency issues that are at stake, and again, the funding issue, which uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll come back to also with the previous speakers. But first, we have Chris Elias with us here. I saw you nodding several times uh, as Marika was speaking, and also at the partners meeting that I mentioned in, in Stockholm, you were actually one of the people People you were asked, you know, I think what your dream would be or something like that. And uh, you, as one of the major donors uh, of WHO and supporters, actually said, well, what I would like to see is, I don't remember exactly, a doubling of assessed contributions. Uh, but uh, give us your feel about, you know, this transformation process and how much that transformation process actually must include a new model of financing. Uh, thanks, Ilona. I, um, um, you'll recall that my response in Stockholm was to the question, what's your dream? Yeah. Um, and I said uh, my dream was the double, that they, the, the member states would double their assessed contributions. I don't think it should be mistaken for practical policy recommendation because it's, they've fought over whether to increase 3 or 10 percent. So I, I think it probably is a dream, at least in the short term. But let me come back to some of the broader themes. Um, to the transformation. You know, transformation is the new change, right? I mean, we used to just change things and make them better. Um, and now we transform everything. And I think we do that um, not just because we needed a new word, but because we have a sense of urgency. Given some of the, the trends in disease burden, given some of the the trends in terms of the complexity of partnerships in an increasingly multipolar world, given the uh, lack of um, recognition that you know organizations like WHO, which were seen as the world's health organization, have kind of the prominent place. People have been questioning that. So it was time for the World Health Organization to transform, to change quickly to be more relevant in a rapidly changing world that the elements of which many of the, the former panelists have talked about. The other thing that I think is critical is, is that change doesn't happen, and certainly transformation doesn't happen overnight. It's not like, unfortunately, it's not like Harry Potter where you can get out your wand and say, you know, mutatis organization mundi, you know? <laughs> uh, it, it starts, and it, and it started a year ago with the approval of the GPW and the different elements that, that uh, Peter has outlined. And, uh, and, it's, and I, I'm optimistic, but it's just beginning. I think it's the, I, I call it, you know, the potential transformation. It does require um, leadership. And I think one of, the sci one of the reasons I'm so optimistic is that in addition to all of the highly earmarked and you know, support that the Gates Foundation provides to WHO, we do provide, um, I don't know, it's probably 10 or $15 million a year of very flexible funds to both the DG's office and the regional off director's offices for some of their important transformational uh, processes. And we began three, maybe four years ago now with the Afro region working with Shidi Moeti on her transformation agenda, um, where in some ways Afro is ahead of headquarters here in setting a tone for culture change, for focus on results, for tailoring its technical assistance and, and human resources to meet the needs of 40 some member states in the region. And that process, which is a few more years advanced than the Geneva process, I think is going well. It's not easy, it's hard, it requires um, making, you know, uh, kind of very objective assessments and then hard decisions to change a complex organization. Um, uh, so I think I'm very optimistic because of what I've seen happening within the Afro region that if that's that model, which is going to be even harder, at, you know, at the, at the Geneva level, you know, working through all six regions, um, but I'm very optimistic about the transformation process. Um, you know, regarding that, I think, you know, uh, Peter summed up, and Peter's very good at summing up in one word important things like impact. But if you think about where, where does WHO have its impact, I think there's many uh, ways to look at that. But one of them is in the 
seamless interconnection, which has not ever been seamless, between the country work, the regional work, and the headquarters work. And I think that's going to be a critical element. And I think some of the things that Dr. Tedros has done to align the GPW in the organization to get that impact, to get the, uh, the norms and standards, technical experts that may sit here in Geneva aligned with the regional support functions to dozens of countries in each of the six regions. And then importantly, what are the skills and roles of the WHO staff in country? As Anders said, in regard to Mexico, it's going to be different in Mexico than it is in the Central African Republic or on the front lines of, of the Ebola response in Eastern DRC. So um, I think you know, getting that right, thinking what impact actually means for the World Health Organization compared to the many other actors in global health is going to be quite critical. Um, it, to, you know, to summarize a few things that I think are kind of where would be the indicators of success. Um, one is, you know, to, you know, I think it's in the broader context of if you look at the progress of, that we made under the MDGs and the challenges we have in the SDGs, we did the easy things. We have much harder things in front of us. And that's where Anders' comments about the healthy population's agenda, that pillar is much harder. And it's not something that can be done from within the health sector alone. We're going to have to reach out to people in all kinds of places, in the food sector, the built environment, et cetera, to actually prevent a lot of that um, disease burden, which is very expensive to manage if it's not prevented successfully. To do that, I think WHO is going to have to in continue to innovate in its partnerships, not just with non-state actors, but with other UN agencies, with government uh, uh, ministries beyond just the health ministry. And to do that, it's going to need flexibility, which it doesn't have in its current financing model. Um, you know, to Marika's point, you know, to have an organization, this is, I think, about the 10th time I've come to the assembly. And in that complex uh, process, I still learned from uh, Professor Birchie about how the, I'm still learning how it works. Um, uh, but in that complex process, I have seen over the last decade the member states add mandate after mandate to the World Health, Assembly, the, the World Health Organization's job. And they haven't added very much financing. The assessed contribution has been flat. There have been big fights over inflationary you know, increases of 3%. And so the organization is highly dependent on external voluntary contributions, which, you know, we, we're, you know, take the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we find many overlaps of our strategic interests with the WHOs. But it's not perfectly aligned. And it doesn't align to all the great mandates that the WHO has. So you wind up with this, some programs very well funded, some not well, very well funded at all. That model has to be examined and improved. So I still dream of a doubling of assessed contributions. Uh, but anything would help. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, if I could turn to you, Madam Ambassador, about uh, this contribution issue, because on the one hand, we're seeing you know, an enormous geopolitical shift. We are seeing that many middle-income countries have made significant progress, both in terms of their economic development, but also their health development. And as far as I'm informed, it was particularly the middle-income countries who were opposed to the increased uh, assessed contributions uh, to WHO. What would it take for member states to be willing to pay for its organization? What's the political hitch here? Of course, always, I, because I wish it was, only, uh, it was only one organization, but if you look at the kind of, of, of contribution that a country needs to make to the whole system and also to the regional system, it, it forces you to be very selective in, in, in increases. And that is linked to the efficiency. What is an organization leaving to the country that is going to be worth increasing the budget? And I, dis I think this is a discussion that all countries have at different levels. And let me tell you, I'm, 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 I, I, I do uh, uh, recognize that uh, uh, the work of WHO has been extremely, uh, has had a very good impact in several regions of the world and, and particularly as has been mentioned in Africa. But let me tell you, we have a particular situation in Latin America, because in Latin America, we work, uh, uh, the, the health, uh, the regional office is the PAHO. 
the Pan American Health Organization. And this organization is 115 years of existence. So it existed before uh, the, the WHO. And since then, we have been working very closely since the establishment of WHO. But very honestly, uh, Latin American countries feel that the WHO is not all the time being there. Always we have a big fight within the, within the PAHO because we have the contributions to PAHO, but we don't see in terms of the budget of the WHO this uh, effectiveness and, and supportive role, always we are behind in terms of financing in the region. I'm saying this because this is part of the dynamics and the politics that countries take into account when accepting uh, to provide new financing. And, and in, in the Latin American region, there is always this reluctance because of the difficult relationship that countries have with PAHO, but also with the support they feel from the WHO but not as strong as it is felt in other regions. So I think this is an issue that, that needs to be tackled to bring more countries in favor. So, uh, and, and, and in Mexico, of course, we have, uh, we have also several issues that we are discussing right now. You know that in Mexico, we had a major government transformation just six months ago. And this uh, government is uh, giving a very important priority to prevention, it was also mentioned that it's very important to talk on prevention, and to primary uh, health uh, uh, care. Because uh, we have an, uh, many specific uh, diseases that are happening in Mexico, which are linked to the lack of healthy lifestyles. It is, so we have to be very carefully talking about the specific needs of the country, of the region. And I think a country is always willing to provide funding because I fully agree that you cannot depend of uh, con voluntary contributions. That is not to give the kind of certainty that we need. We want a strong uh, WHO. We want really to have them a normative role and we, have, we want to see impact. And to do that, you need to have a reliable funding. And this is not... Uh, there, the way. But this is an ongoing discussion. I think the transformation began very recently. There are many areas that really need to be discussed. Uh, and as long as we have the answers that, that we need, I think countries will do the efforts to provide funding, but it's not an easy, it's not an easy avenue. Thank you, and thank you to uh, both uh, Chris and you, Madam Ambassador, to highlight the regional issues as well that are part of this transformative thing. You know, I used to work in, in PAHO and uh, experience some of that tension. And sometimes it actually reminded me of the tension between European countries and Brussels, you know, uh, where uh, the question was, you know, what you gave visibility to and uh, how it all played out. So I think there's still also quite a political and cultural shift here that needs to happen. I think also one of the, the things that uh, I'd like to come back to first with, with you, Anders, uh, and, uh, and then Marike, is also this development of saying, yes, we need to transform WHO, but as we do this, we need to transform our relationship with our brother and sister health organizations, and even beyond that, what is happening on the SDG3 action plan that was initiated by a, a number of countries. And we're now also, the step is moving forward uh, to, uh, first of all, take that to the country level, but also to start involving the civil society organizations. So, unless you also worked at the country level of WHO, if you look at this effort of you know, let's transform ourselves not only towards the inside, not only at headquarters, our relationship between regions, at country office, and then with the Global Fund, with the World Food Program, with you and women. You know, how is that manageable and how do you see that and to what extent have you been involved in trying to move that forward? I think what will help is this, uh, both new strategies, so it's clear what WHO should be doing, the transformation agenda, and also being clear about what are the functions of WHO. Uh, because if you are clear about the functions, that there are certain things that only WHO should and, should and could be doing. When I was working in Sierra Leone, I was the head of the country office there during the end of the Ebola outbreak. Uh, taking one concrete example, I mean, there were certain things that WHO can do, but there were other things that CDC could do. But there were things that WHO only could do. 
and to be more clear about what are those functions that will help to get a more effective system. Because we don't have 12 organizations being part now of the Global Action Plan for SDG 3 that are equal, that are the same, that are coming with the same functions or resources to the table. Some are coming with money, some are coming with technical support, and that's, I think, also why this collaboration in between WHO and the Gates Foundation, you need WHO to be able to be effective on your other programs, and you made that very clear in Stockholm. So I think this is really where WHO need to be more focused and clear. Um, and I think one of the challenges with that, um, coming back to what I said before, is that unfortunately at the country level, WHO is not there yet. Being clear about this, being um, stringent to those functions, and most important, the quality is not good enough yet. So I think really there is a good agenda, there is a good transformation agenda, uh, but really now there is a need for major change. I mean, I was a bit embarrassed when I left the Sierra Leone office and we had 150 staff, uh, 7 million people. Out of those 150 staff, 100 were professionals. So, two-thirds. Afro at large, as um, I mean, Chris, you were saying that they're making good progress. I don't think they're making good progress enough yet. Because, I mean, total number of professional staff at the country level in WHO is 20%. And increased from last year with one more percent. This is the big challenge for WHO, not having enough of highly quali quality uh, staff at the country level. And that needs to happen if what WHO is going to be an effective partner in that partnership. The second point on the... Uh, the Global Action Plan uh, with the 12 organizations. This, I think, is a good way of trying to make the present system more effective. But is that the system we need for the future to be able to tackle the real SDG3, as I was saying? If we're going to work on enabling people to make more healthy choices, are we going to work with more other sectors? I mean, possibly, I mean, we need uh, different kinds of international organization, different structures, functions of those. What we have today is very much an MDG global health architecture. Have we began to speak about what we need for the SDG? No, not yet. But it's good that we try to make the present system more effective, but we have not really started talking about, is this really what we need? Also taking in how the global health needs are changing, countries' needs are changing. There is a need for some reforms of the whole system, but we haven't started that yet. Thank you, Maraki. Could you pick that up? And particularly also this, this latter point, because if we look right now, and it's sort of linked between the MDG architecture and also the funding architecture, that you know, there's a very, very strong civil society voice to replenish the global fund, to replenish Gavi, uh, to some extent, you know, the new GFF, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, but how does it come together in terms of what I, I said earlier, you know, support and protect WHO? And how do you see this SDG3 action plan contributing to that? You've started the discussions now. I know they haven't been going on for a long time, but they have started. So what's your view on this? Well... First of all, I think it's it's uh, good to keep in mind that there's a, a big variety of civil society positions, of course, and there's some organizations, as you said, very much pushing forward for Global Fund, Gavi, GFF replenishments, and there's others seeing more like a, a broader, trying to see more like a broader picture um, and focusing more on the role of WHO as an overarching um, agency to actually coordinate uh, uh, global health. And we were actually quite, quite uh, happy to see that this global action plan uh, was pushed forward because that was what we were always asking for. The WHO would uh, be put in a position to uh, coordinate global health effectively. Um, so we followed it very closely and um, w what we found now is that um, this global action plan is currently only developed on a global policy level between those 12 um, partners um, who signed uh, the, the action plan. And it's, it's actually, there's a huge gap in between what is debated there and what is uh, actually relevant on country level. And um, we think it would have been necessary, and as you also understood it before, actually to ask the questions, uh, do we need to do this global action plan together with the uh, agencies in place with these mainly MDG 
agencies or, or do we need something different? And I think this can be very well seen um, that, for example, this uh, whole aspect of uh, human resources is not really reflected in the, in the Global Action Plan. I mean, there's a huge gap of, of human resources um, everywhere in the world, basically, and um, this hasn't been reflected at all. So we were in debates about that, and we tried very hard, as uh, some civil society organizations, to, to ask for more like of uh, civil society engagement in here also. And um, this has been a black hole actually until now, so there hasn't been any um, engagement uh, with the civil society. There was one meeting, a one-day meeting, but I mean the action plan is going to be finalized in, in September. But I also think what would be very relevant is to, to um, debate or to have this action plan uh, reflected with member states also. Because what we heard is that there's also a reluctance of member states actually to accept this global action plan as their um, global action plan on um, SCG 3. So I think at the end uh, there is a big danger that uh, this is another global policy paper which is not really going to bring a change on, on country level and this would be um, very um, difficult also for the role of WHO. And I think this relationship also between WHO and these uh, other 11 partners is, is also not very clear. We would always expect WHO to be like, an, as I said, an overarching uh, in the lead agency to lead this process. But then, of course, we see that the other uh, partners, I mean, there's also, uh, they come with a lot of funds, of course, and then there's also a difficulty to actually have uh, this strong WHO being able to really uh, push that forward and coordinate that. Thank you, Chris. Can I ask you, uh, in terms of this MDG, SDG model, I think, you know, the MDG model very much suited the DNA of the Gates Foundation. You know, very focused programs where one could really make a difference, not only alone, but together with partners, moving it forward at various levels of action. So if we're now saying, uh, you know, we need to move into that SDG mode of action, there's, of course, still the famous unfinished agenda. But how, in a sense, do you yourselves, you know, there, I guess there's also transformation in the Gates Foundation. Uh, how do you... Uh, uh, think about change, how uh, you act, and how does that relate to the WHO transformation? Yeah, so um, uh, that's a complex question. Um, the, um, uh, we're, we're constantly evolving as an organization, right? So I, I, I wouldn't call it transformation in our case. I think, recall that, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a family foundation, and fortunately, uh, Bill and Melinda are some of the fastest learners I have ever met. So it's true that at the very beginning of the foundation's work, um, there was, you know, if you go back to, we're almost 20 years old now, uh, there was a, almost a naive day of that um, we understood there were market failures in the production of global public goods, and that's where we focused initially, under the somewhat naive assumption that if we fix some of those market failures through public-private partnerships and develop new drugs and new vaccines for important problems like malaria that the pharma industry wasn't paying attention to, that markets and governments would pick up those innovations and use them. That looks naive in retrospect because what, what's clear is that we started, you know, 20 years ago to fuel through research and development and public-private partnership a pipeline of new innovations that the health systems were not prepared to adopt or scale for use. We were facing what I called 10 years ago an innovation pileup, um, that we had the fattest pipeline of new product development and we didn't have systems that were prepared. And so our evolution, if you will, from the MDGs to the SDGs is more about understanding that system that underlies the prevention and promotion and, and addressing uh, morbidity and mortality reduction. And that, in our view, is, is the primary healthcare system. We think it aligns very well with the universal health coverage agenda. Um, 80, you know, depends on who you talk to, 70 to 90% of, of, of health problems can be uh, either prevented or addressed at frontline uh, primary healthcare centers. And if you do that, you will avoid the very expensive care that's required at tertiary, uh, secondary and tertiary care. 
Unfortunately, many countries are making poor allocative decisions with their meager health budgets, putting it mostly into tertiary care uh, centers in capitals for the elites. I think the UHC agenda, that pillar of the, of the global program of work, is in some ways the most transformational. If the UHC agenda can drive, it reflects the, the SDG uh, uh, goal of leaving no one behind, addressing everyone's need, and doing it in a way that doesn't create financial ruin when they get ill. I, and so we've begun to think, you know, just seven, eight years ago, we didn't have a very strong focus on health system strengthening, et cetera. Um, now, if you, if you listen to Bill Gates in, in his lectures, one of our top priorities, one of the things he talks about most is primary health care and the importance of the system, not just for finishing the job with the MDG uh, uh, preventable, you know, infectious disease, um, vaccine preventable illness, et cetera, but also as a platform for addressing a rapidly rising increase in the prevalence and disease burden of non-communicable diseases um, and a wide variety. So, so as we think about you know, going from the MDG to the SDG area, we don't think about, okay, what are the next five diseases to address? We think more about what's the system that would actually help to address most of the, the morbidity and mortality that varies greatly across regions and countries. And so that's, I wouldn't call it a transformation. I think it's an evolution, a significant evolution in our focus has been away from uh, disease-specific interventions, which we still are very involved with. Our biggest support to WHO is to finish the job on polio eradication. But to actually begin to think about things like the Primary Healthcare Performance Initiative, an important piece of work that WHO and the World Bank are leading with our support and, and many others. So I, I think that's our shift, has been get, paying more attention to the system, in particular the primary healthcare system, as a platform for addressing the key issues that we need to address as we go forward into the SDG era. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And of course, that's music to some of our ears that were criticizing the Gates Foundation earlier on, uh, that uh, they were perhaps too focused on, on diseases. I was also intrigued uh, reading recently uh, one of the statements by uh, Bill Gates actually highlighting in relation to polio uh, to say, you know, I thought if we had, you know, the technical issues right, we'd be able to do this. And I've learned recently how important politics is in all of this. So, you know, those learning organizations uh, is uh, a very important thing. And being able to say, yes, as of now, we're going to do things differently. So, uh, Peter, if you've heard these points, uh, what are the ones you'd like to highlight about doing things differently? Just mention three or four. There were so many, but I'm sure you will. Thank you very much. So the first thing to say is I really appreciated the feedback and the comments of all the panelists. There was actually, I think I would say, nothing that uh, we would disagree with. I mean, it was all very thoughtful. Even the critical feedback is much appreciated. Um, so maybe, Alona, what I'll do is amplify four things that came out just to make sure that our, the messages are, are clear. Um, the first thing I want to say is uh, the, it's very clear to us that the value in the global action plan, 80% of the value is at the country level. So just to completely agree with, uh, with Marika and her point, I don't have time to unpack that, um, but there's a technical briefing tomorrow, a civil society engagement tomorrow. Please come and that'll be unpacked, but that was your top line message. And just to, to say, yes, it's called a global action plan, uh, but the value is definitely at how these organizations work at the country level in support of national priorities. And I participated in a country dialogue myself in Ghana, and it's uh, absolutely clear that's the case. Second point I want to make um, is that WHO, Dr. Tedros, are a thousand per percent behind the replenishment of the global fund. They're a thousand percent behind the uh, replenishment of Gavi that comes after that. Uh, we don't see it as a zero-sum game, uh, and uh, he's particularly interested in that end beneficiary and what happens to her. And these channels all need to work, and they need to work together. So just to be really, really clear about that, and uh, 
I uh, wanted to make that point. Thirdly, I wanted to take the specific example of gender equity and rights because it's so important. Um, so this is actually a, an example of marching towards implementation. So in the GPW, in the strategy, we put uh, gender equality, equity, and human rights front and center as an extremely important strategic issue. In the operating model refresh, the gender equity and rights team was elevated to the director general's office. But probably most importantly, in the program budget that you'll see uh, debated, I think, Tuesday afternoon, um, there are 42 outputs in the program budget which measure what WHO is doing. And a balanced scorecard approach to measuring success of those outputs, and one of the attributes on the balanced scorecard is gender equity and rights. So it's one thing to say we're gonna mainstream gender equality, uh, equity, and human rights. It's another thing to measure the extent to which every single thing you do, and I don't only mean on the program side, I'm also talking on the corporate side, like gender-based budgeting, et cetera, uh, on the basis of gender equity and rights. So um, just wanted that, those are important, significant steps towards implementation. It's not the end of the story, but it shows you how critical concepts in the transformation cutting across the five are being implemented. And then the last thing um, I wanted to mention is just a, uh, a request. Um, you know, one of the many 75 documents or something that you'll come across at the World Health Assembly is called the 2018 Results Report. And it's the midterm review of the 1819 program budget. I would ask you, please, to pull out that results report. There'll be hard copies there on Monday, to read it carefully and to give us your feedback. Because results, impact, that's what's at the heart of WHO. That results report essentially presents our results according to the billions. Tell us what you think. Tell us where you'd like to see those results be better. And if we focus there, um, and that is actually where Dr. Tedros' leadership is focused, and you get there through strong normative function and everything else that was mentioned, the good relationships with civil society, et cetera, if we focus on results together, because it has to be a collective effort, and we accept that, uh, actually, I think they're very impressive, but they can be better. We could highlight failures better in the report. The report itself could be improved. The process of developing it could be improved. The results themselves could be improved, as in any organization. And approaching that topic with humility across the billions, including, and I agree with everything uh, um, Anders said about the third billion, and by the way, in the program budget, it's more clearly defined than in the GPW. That would be the place to look. Um, let's look together. So you're wondering, well, how do you find this thing amongst the 75 documents? Any thoughts? Exactly, you go to at Peter A. Singer, <laughs> where <laughs> I probably only tweeted about it 50,000 times in the last week. So go down, and it won't take very long for you to find a tweet about the results report. Um, seriously, it's obviously also on in the, in the documents, but it's not that easy to find among 75 documents. Um, but please find it there, and not only that, make it a two-way street. Give us your feedback. What do you think about those results? Where do you think they can be improved? That's the way together, um, we young people in the room will be able to really um, uh, implement, implement uh, the vision of the GPW and the visionary leadership, uh, and I have to say this uh, honestly of Dr. Tedros, driving the whole organization through the five levels of transformation with these very important, look at the partners here along the, along the front and all of you, listening, improving, learning, as Chris said, this is what we need to do together. So please have a look at that and uh, let us know what you think and let's work on that uh, together because that can be a focus of our activity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. We've reached the end of our panel. I'd like to say thank you very, very much uh, to our panelists. I think some really important points were raised and uh, were clarified both by member states and the other partners. I just want to say one thing which is so important, and that comes up every time we speak about country focus. 
We need the country focus, but we need the global public goods. And we need that clear interface between the global public goods, the normative role, and the country focus. And we need that in particular, and this refers to something that Anders said and that also last week we had uh, discussed in Germany, is you know, that we're talking about the World Health Organization. We're talking about an organization that has to be relevant for each and every member state, just as the sustainable development goals are a challenge to each and every member state. And to be able to bring that together also in terms of that global social contract that I spoke about, I think that will be one of the most important roles of the WHO and as a dimension of that, of the SDG3 action plan. Anders wants the last word, you may. Thank you. No, but that is also very much linked to the financing. Yeah. Because WHO today, it's not as bad as 20%. 30% is actually flexible if you take in some of the flexible funding and some of the overheads that they're putting into the flexible. But still, the rest is also coming from uh, development assistance. And development assistance is not aligned to the priorities today. Those are aligned to the priorities of the MDG agenda. And because of that, we need a different kind of financing. Um, and also just to say that the replenishment of the global funding Gavi, those are 100% flexible resources. So it's not that countries can't do flexible resources. Negotiating the financing for the, for the World Bank or the regional development banks, negotiating strategy and financing on the same time, all the resources from all countries, from Mexico, from Sweden, unearmarked. But we agree on priorities and we agree on financing. I think we need a different kind of thinking around financing because even if WHO, and we had that discussion in Stockholm, today has got 105% of the resources they need for this biennium, but not for the right things. Big gaps in certain areas and too much in others. And 3,000 reports expected to give back. The cost for reporting to all of those 3,000 partners is enormous. So we need reforms, not just of what you have outlined, Peter, but also of the financing. Thank you very much, Anders. I think that gives a very good sort of closing uh, point around that and gives part of the responsibility back to the member states and the donors and uh, what they give, what they expect, and the responsibilities they're willing to take on. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this. Give a thanks to the panelists, please. Yeah. So it's now my pleasure to hand over to John Lange. Please, John. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very, thank you very much, Alona. Uh, why don't everybody stand up? We'll begin in two minutes. Uh, so please feel free, stand up and uh, relax a bit. And if I could ask the next panelists to please come forward.
if everybody could please be seated. And Dr. Major, if you're here, please. Okay, could everybody, if you could please be seated, we're about to begin. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats again. We'd like to continue. I'm trying to support John here. Please sit down. Could we ask all our speakers to come up to the stage, please, who are here to do briefings? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Uh, yeah. No, I see. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for uh, uh, being here for this segment of uh, the Introduction to the World Health Assembly, a briefing for delegates. Uh, we're here with a very distinguished panel of uh, experts from the World Health Organization. And I must say, the reason we ask WHO experts to come here uh, and make these presentations is that we're not trying to uh, get into the debates that the member states will be getting into uh, uh, in the next uh, week and a half. We're really trying to make this an explanatory forum. And these experts from WHO really know these issues inside and out for their respective fields. Uh, it's really quite a distinguished panel. Uh, and you've already got their biographies uh, in your uh, 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 the handouts that were presented at the front, so I won't go into great detail on them. Uh, but I do want to make sure you're aware of uh, 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 who each of these people are. Uh, you've got the, behind me their titles, etc. Uh, and we'll begin with a discussion of health emergencies. Uh, that's something that's uh, uh, the kind of thing that's getting front page news all over the world these days, particularly in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the Ebola outbreak. Uh, Dr. Jaoud Major works uh, directly with uh, Mike Ryan and others on uh, this emergency response, and uh, Dr. Major is the Assistant Director General for Emergency Preparedness and the International Health Regulations. If we could please hear from you, Doctor. Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting us to this uh, very important meeting. As you said in your introductory remark, the emergency is becoming central uh, work in WHO and uh, since the uh, Ebola 2014 outbreak, uh, the, this area of work was completely restructured uh, to focus on, uh, on the emergency in terms of detection, in terms of capacity uh, to respond to and also in terms of recovery. Uh, last two years we are dedicated mostly to strengthen our capacity to, to respond to outbreaks and uh, many of the outbreaks of course who are not on the media were immediately detected and contained but some of them uh, uh, we are facing some challenges and we'll come back to that later on. Uh, during this transformation that Dr. Tedros is conducting he uh, would like to make the preparedness uh, in the center of the emergency program work and uh, if you can summarize what's happening in DRC today is uh, literally not failure of response or defective response, but mainly lack of preparedness because this country was prepared to deal with small Ebola outbreaks, but definitely one was not prepared to deal with a big Ebola outbreak happening in urban setting with uh, some other challenges. Today, the uh, 
outbreak of Ebola in DRC is the second largest one in the whole Ebola uh, history. And uh, so far we reached 1,760 cases with almost two thirds of uh, case fatality rates. Uh, the operation or the public health operation on the field are uh, conducted in, in very, uh, let us say, uh, energic way. But we are facing three challenges in, in the DRC and come back to that in discussion if you wish. The first one is the security issues. Uh, this is a very volatile area where uh, security is volatile, where uh, group armed fighting and making our operations uh, very difficult. Although we, we have strong tools to fight Ebola, and this time we have the vaccine, which we didn't have last time. We have some good medications, but still what is lacking is space for us to operate and to reach the contact, reach the patient and reach who need to be reached by, by our um, uh, public health measures. Second challenge is the community acceptance. And uh, this Ebola outbreak is highly politicized and politically instrumentalized. And uh, uh, the community is uh, having some difficulty to accept the public health measures that we are proposing and interventions. Uh, also because the, the health system uh, in this area is so weak that cannot provide elementary healthcare services, uh, the uh, community is suspecting why for Ebola, whatever they want, they can have it. And when they need any service from the health system or from the uh, health sector, they cannot get it. And this has created some kind of suspicion to the uh, to the. To, 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 to deal with what we are proposing. The third one, the third challenge is the funding and a huge gap of funding uh, to finish the, the, the work. This is why uh, uh, the WHO since now weeks uh, uh, asked the intervention of the whole US, UN, UN family and this is why today we are resetting all our operation uh, in, in, in the field, focusing on more political commitment more financing and more readiness, more uh, uh, complementarity and interaction between all concerned agencies to cover all the areas, not only the Ebola, because today if we don't fix uh, other basic needs of the population, they cannot trust the Ebola outbreak and they cannot, uh, uh, the responders, and they cannot trust what we are proposing to them. And uh, this is why Mike Ryan is on the field to uh, put in place this kind of measures. Uh, of course, what we are operating under, uh, under uh, the international health regulations, and uh, this is from where we are taking our uh, mandate, and I come back to that later, later on, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Majur. You mentioned the financing, uh, uh, important, and, and there's actually a, uh, another issue that I hope we can get to during the questions and answers regarding the uh, fin financing of the contingency fund for emergencies and other issues. Certainly, you need funding. Uh, we now uh, would like to uh, uh, discuss uh, the uh, efforts to achieve universal health coverage, which, of course, involves uh, several uh, elements within WHO and uh, several assistant directors general, but also plans for the UN high-level meeting on uh, UHC that will be taking place uh, this September. And so we have with us Dr. Ranier Guerra, the assistant director general, and he's the WHO lead for the UN high-level meeting on universal health coverage. Please, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation as well. The can we go with the first? Just to frame, just to frame the discussion. This is uh, the reason why we have high-level meeting on UHC at the next uh, UN General Assembly. It was decided by the member states and uh, under their leadership, we are supporting the two pen holders, two facilitators, Georgia and Thailand, to uh, draft a declaration that will be negotiated now with different member states in New York. The aim is to make sure that heads of state, heads of government, the big shots, not those convening here at the WHA where we talk among friends, ministers of health, and that set of specialists, but somewhere different, where people who can decide can take UHC as their key issue in the agenda and make sure that financing 
attention focus from different countries globally is indeed achieved. The, the, different, the different steps and the different issues that you can expect during the WHA are around basically three different resolutions. One resolution on UHC will talk about primary health care, its relevance as the key aspect of uh, the system development globally. It follows the Astana Declaration, the big meetings we had last year in Astana for the commemoration of uh, the Almata Declaration that opened the doors to the primary health care movement. The second resolution talks about community health workers and their role within the health system, the way they should be supported and they should provide support to the implementation of universal health coverage. The third talks about the means and the ways we, we can foresee to support the dialogue among heads of state in New York to go to the final declaration. There is one peculiar issue in New York the high-level meeting is not called by the Secretary General, is not called by the UN system. It has been called by the member states. It is superseded by the President of the, of the General Assembly. Whatever the resolutions will talk about, the commitments that the resolution will come with will be binding. So this is the key aspect that creates the difference in whatever other meetings which are foreseen during the very crowded week, last week of September in New York, talking about the global action plan that you have been, uh, that you heard during the previous session, and others on financing for development and uh, the climate change and climate change hitting small insular states, those will be initiated by the UN system. As such, they will not be binding. This instead will be. So you can guess that uh, taking the references of my colleague talking about emergency and outbreaks on the ground, this will be a different fight. But we can expect the same kind of uh, ammunition, the same kind of ambushes, the same kind of shortcomings, the same kind of uh, big fight that we'll have in front of us trying to support the two facilitators in running the negotiation. There is a reason. This is where we are today with the, with the global indicators that matters that we try to overcome by means of the full implementation of universal coverage. We are behind, and this has been clear. This is clear to everybody. The main issue is that the estimate that we have run with the current situation, the current trends, tell us that by 2030, a minimum of one-third of the global population will not be served, will not be covered. The updated model tells us that perhaps we are very optimistic and perhaps it is between 45 and 50 percent of the global population that will be underserved. This means that all the indicators that you heard from Peter Singers and the others will be challenged. The old system that we are trying to put in place will be challenged. And unless we get an acceleration by heads of state with a full commitment to implement universal coverage, we will fail to achieve the SDGs. And this has to be the clear message to all the heads of state. This is something that goes even beyond the social contract. It goes into survival of specific population groups who are just left behind. You know that the, the mantra for us is no one has to be left behind but we are leaving behind a number of people. At the same time, during the assembly, we will talk about the global action plan on migrants' health and refugees' health. As you know, this is very controversial. This is something that all member states are not ready to accept and see as a challenge to their sovereignty, if you wish. Uh, this is something that we need to, to discuss and we need to uh, put central in our, in our agenda. Tedros at the G7 meeting that he had two days ago was very clear. Unless we disaggregate indicators, unless we disaggregate numbers, unless we try to find out those who are otherwise excluded, even by the inclusion in the nominators and nominators of our indicators, we are going to fail. 
And this is something that the, the final declaration in, in New York hopefully will take into consideration. Uh, what you can expect in the near future, after the discussion in the WHA, from the 28th of this month, there will be the negotiation, the formal negotiations that will start in New York. The two facilitators with our support will meet all the member states. We try to figure out what of the zero draft which has been circulated yesterday by the president of the General Assembly can stay, what kind of changes, what kind of modifications will be, will be proposed and uh, made acceptable for the UN General Assembly to approve and to commit to. It will be a long negotiation. It will go for a meeting every week until the end of July. August will be reflection and possibly good reflection. By the beginning of September, everything will have to be done so that by the end of September, with a, with a, a General Assembly in place, we will get this that we hope will be a huge booster for the, the movement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Guerra. Uh, uh, and it's actually quite fitting to be discussing this in, uh, issue uh, following the earlier discussion uh, on the panel when uh, there, were, uh, there was a lot of focus on the transition from the uh, Millennium Development Goal era to the Sustainable Development Goal era and how that involves ministries beyond the ministers of health. And uh, the, the idea that this meeting on uh, universal health coverage will take place in New York at the United Nations uh, involving the entire UN system and m all of member states uh, is another indication of that, that it's not just an issue for to be dealt with by uh, ministers of health. Uh, next, we'll move to a discussion of the Nagoya Protocol, its public health implications and its impact on seasonal influenza virus sharing. I think we missed one word in our title here by talking about uh, seasonal virus sharing, and it's really seasonal influenza virus sharing. Uh, but uh, since we're dealing with a lawyer here, I'm sure he can correct us for anything else we've made a mistake on. I'm happy to introduce Steve Solomon, who's the Principal Legal Officer for Governing Bodies at WHO. Please. Thank you, John. Could I use the podium? Is that uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Okay, th thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, and it is a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's also a pleasure to talk to you about a subject which is coming to the Health Assembly for the very first time. That is the Nagoya Protocol to the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, the, um, uh, this issue has come up in the Executive Board. It was considered by the Executive Board in January 2017. Uh, but it has not yet been considered by the Health Assembly. And specifically, the issue is the implications on public health for the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol. So the Nagoya Protocol is a relatively new instrument. It is essentially an access and benefit sharing instrument that promotes uh, fairness and equity. And in the view of the Secretariat, included in the report of the, to the Executive Board that we did, in promoting fairness and equity in global health, it can also promote and encourage the access and sharing of the pathogens themselves. And this is important because pathogens are essential for public health. Uh, here is a very brief slide listing the things it's important for. The bottom line is that timely sharing strengthens global efforts to prevent and respond to public health events and emergencies. And in a moment, at the very end, we're gonna talk about seasonal influenza to illustrate how this all works. But there are some key questions that we have shared with member states and provided some answers for and sh we'll share with you. First of all, why is this a, even an issue for health ministries? Because the Nagoya Protocol, as you've, uh, those who are familiar with it, deals with genetic resources. Well, for uh, many, if not m uh, most states, particularly the parties to the Nagoya Protocol, some 116, uh, pathogens are, fall under the rubric of genetic resources. And in fact, there's, there's very, uh, very good indication in the Nagoya Protocol itself that this is the case. The Nagoya Protocol speaks about public health in very important ways, and it speaks about public health also in the context of public health emergencies, which you've heard about. So this is a matter for health ministries, not only for ministries of agriculture and ministries of environment, which are principally were involved in the negotiation of the Nagoya Protocol, 
but also for health ministries. And part of the importance of the discussion at the Health Assembly this week will be raising awareness among health ministries themselves about the importance of this so they can follow this and they can participate in their domestic implementation processes for implementing the protocol. So what are examples of the Nagoya Protocol? Uh, what are examples are there of implications for public health? As I said, this is a new instrument, and it's an instrument which essentially requires that any sharing of genetic resources be coupled with the sharing of benefits derived from the use of those genetic resources. That's why I said it's rooted in principles of fairness and equity. Uh, so if, if pathogens, are, as pathogens are, uh, fall within this rubric, uh, the exchange of pathogens, which has generally taken place on a free and open basis, is now subject to the requirements to provide for the sharing of benefits, so-called mutually agreed terms on benefits, which can be monetary and non-monetary, and also the prior informed consent of the states providing the genetic resources. The Nagoya Protocol, however, is oriented in a bilateral direction. That is, if you share a genetic resource, you work out an agreement to share benefits. And that works well generally, but when it comes to timeliness of sharing for public health of pathogens, that may be one of only several ways to ensure that both public health and global health equity are advanced. And so the protocol includes mechanisms which allow for the possibility of multilateral sharing, quicker conclusion of agreements on the sharing, and there are a number of other mechanisms in the protocol which deal with public health, as I said. What is WHO doing about this so far? Uh, WHO is doing, has done three things. First of all, we did a study on this, which is available on the website. Uh, as I said, it was reviewed by the uh, executive board in 2017. Uh, that study is appended, is, is cited in the material that's going to this health assembly. Secondly, we, are, uh, acti we have activated a cross-WHO working group, bringing in all the different seg sectors of WHO to work on this, because it has implications for emergency response, it has implications for food safety networks, for uh, antimicrobial resistance, really anything we're sharing of pathogens is important. And finally, what are the opportunities for public health here? The opportunities are to advance, and this again was the conclusion of the 2017 study, both opportunities for greater sharing of the benefits deriving from the use of, of pathogens, as well as the access to and sharing of pathogens themselves. Uh, this is the slide which I want to sh talk about seasonal influenza, give you a picture of the scope of sharing and how large it is, because this really, uh, what we what we'll talk about here for a moment, very briefly, is what's called the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System. This is over 150 laboratories, part of a WHO network. And every year, these laboratories, pictured in the map there, analyze some 3,500,000 samples of influenza virus. 40 of those samples are shared, 40,000 are shared amongst all these labs that are pictured in various web-like arrangements. Of those 40,000, some 10,000 are fully characterized by what's known as WHO collaborating centers. Some 60 out of that original are selected as candidate reference viruses, and just 20 are selected as what's called candidate vaccine viruses. This matters because this is what forms the basis of your influenza vaccine that you get every year, if you get it. So there's a tremendous amount of sharing that goes on, there's a tremendous amount of utility to global health security in the aggregate comparison of these pathogens and ensuring that systems like this can continue robustly with timely sharing and to share at the same time the, the utilization of the benefits of this is the challenge for public health that will be taken up by member states at the assembly. That just sort of shows you the funnel and the bottom line. The GISRIS, Global Influenza Surveillance Response System, 
3,500,000 specimens tested, 20 vaccine viruses selected. What will happen at the WHA 72? So we're, uh, the, first of all, there is the report, which is available on, online. You heard Peter Singer say it is hard to find. So if you go to Google and you just word search Nagoya, you can find in those list of 72 documents the one on the Nagoya Protocol. Um, the uh, report makes clear that the Secretariat is prepared to take forward with all relevant stakeholders uh, this issue. And the all relevant stakeholders cannot be overemphasized here because this is a multi-stakeholder issue and it will only go forward well if it involves all. And by all we mean here, for, first and foremost, the Convention on Biological Diversity Secretariat, with whom we work closely with, with ministries and communities of agriculture and environment, with the private sector, with databases, with civil society, with everyone involved in what has been a very robust system, which now has to think about a new system of regulatory arrangements and how best to work in that system. And so the report asks for, the report to the assembly asks for guidance on this from member states. And there's already been a proposal on a mandate for us, and it's reprinted here. Uh, the delegation of Finland has proposed a draft decision which would focus on the importance of intensifying this collaboration, which I just mentioned, and the importance of reporting back. We are very much at the first step of this. We're at the first stage of understanding this, gathering evidence, gathering data, gathering uh, information about how this is working is essential to figure out how it can work best as we go forward. So maybe, John, I'll stop there and, of course, open to questions at the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, uh, I appreciate uh, very much the, 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 the idea that the WHO Secretariat is uh, uh, bringing this to the attention of Ministries of Health. I remember back when I was involved in the pandemic influenza preparedness uh, framework negotiations in the first couple of years, and uh, my first WHA was in 2007. Um, we were negotiating that in parallel with the uh, Nagoya protocol, but they were really treated as totally separate. And uh, uh, while you talk about the potential opportunities here for the Nagoya protocol for ministries of health, there are probably potential risks too, if, especially if uh, there were to be any delay in the timely sharing of pathogens, because uh, that was a key element of the uh, PIP negotiations, as, as they were called, uh, due to the importance of uh, timely sharing of uh, any kind of uh, pathogen out there, particularly uh, uh, the seasonal influenza viruses and what the PIP is focused on is the, uh, the, those with pandemic potential. We'll talk more about that also in the, in the Q&A. Thank you. Um, as you know, uh, uh, for those of you who followed the World Health Assembly in the last uh, several years, access to medicines has been an important issue, and there's uh, now increased discussion of uh, uh, the, the transparency of markets for medicines, vaccines, and other health-related technologies. So we're very pleased to have with us today Andrew Rintoul, who's uh, a scientist in, uh, in the Access to Medicines, Vaccines, and Pharmaceuticals Division of WHO. Please, doctor. Thank you. Um, I've got some slides that should come up. Um, so obviously access to medicines is something that's close to um, everyone's heart and we want to, um, everyone wants access to the medicines that they need um, under Sustainable Development Goal 3.8. Um, access to affordable quality essential medicines is something that WHO is um, actively working towards. At the coming World Health Assembly, we have a, um, uh, a, res a draft resolution has been put forward by Italy, um, co-sponsored by Greece, Malaysia, Portugal, Serbia, Slovenia, South Africa, Turkey and Uganda. And we've already had two informal um, sessions negotiating the, um, the uh, resolution and we have two more scheduled bef um, just after the start of the assembly on Tuesday and Wednesday this week. WHO supports the affordability of medicines and basically the issue is quite simple. We want to get the right medicine or health product or intervention to the right person at the right price. Very simple to say in words but very complicated to make happen. 
WHO supports transparency, so working towards making, um, working towards uh, sharing information from clinical trials, uh, in improving governance to hold account to the people that are responsible for improving access to medicines. This edis, um, resolution, it's, as in draft form at the moment, um, is focused on, some elements are focused on price, so transparency of price, but also transparency of R&D costs. And this graph behind me here is a graph um, from the United Nations high-level panel, Access to Medicines, which gives an estimate of the cost to produce a medicine um, ranging from 4.2 billion down to 100 million, which is an estimate from the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative to make a medicine. Now, if you can pause and think in your head how much um, the revenue, try and think of a cancer medicine and think of the revenue that is gained from a cancer medicine and just keep that in the back of your mind and I'll show you a scary graph in a moment. Um, we, this, uh, this, um, the resolution seeks to take into account public funding of research and development costs. So looking at um, uh, funding that may come from governments and looking at perhaps some um, return on investment um, for governments when they invest in R&D. But this uh, resolution is, um, is just part of the work that WHO has done. So, and we, uh, within the resolution, we'll be asked to do, um, member states will be asked to do some things and governments will be asked to do some things as well. One of the um, reports that we'd been asked to do previously by member states was a report on access to cancer medicines and looking at the prices of cancer medicines. And in, the, um, in that um, report, which we sent to the executive board earlier this year, we made some um, recommendation to, to countries, to member states, on what they can do to help improve the affordability of medicines. In that, we had a look at the um, we had a look at some of the revenue for some of the largest cancer medicines that are um, that are on the market at the moment. And for example, two of the um, cancer medicines that are on the essential medicines list are in this graph here. But this is a graph of um, over time, how much, uh, how long a medicine's been available in the market, and then the revenue from medicines. And so two key medicines that we can see here are rituximab and trastuzumab, which are on the essential medicines list. And they've got revenue of $88 billion over time, or $93 billion over time. And these are medicines where we still don't, ha we don't have access in low income countries to these medicines, and high income countries are still um, restricting access and rationing treatment to patients. In our report, we made several recommendations, um, and six, uh, six recommendations, but one of them's on improving transparency of, uh, uh, of pricing and pricing approaches to medicines. Um, we encourage countries to exclose the transaction prices of medicines um, to relevant stakeholders. We encourage countries to disclose and control prices through the supply chain of medicines, making sure that medicines are affordable to patients at the end of the supply chain. We'll have examples of medicines that have prices and negotiated that are uh, in a, an example is Nigeria that no, get, negotiated a 50% price reduction on a medicine, but by the time it made it through the supply chain to the patients, the medicine cost exactly the same because the price was subsumed by the um, markups in the distribution network. We also um, and, uh, encourage people to report on the cost of um, producing um, medicines and um, any public sources of funding for R&D. This, um, this is likely to be a lively discussion at the Assembly and the Secretariat's role is to work with the member states to come and um, to negotiate an agreement to put forward something for the WHO to work on and so that we can support them and they can support us in helping improve access to medicines. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Andrew. 
the, um, uh, I, I commend you on your diplomatic language. This is likely to be a lively discussion <laughs> at the World Health Assembly. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are uh, going to be various viewpoints on this uh, uh, from uh, 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 those uh, countries that uh, 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 are, are concerned about the, the access to medicines, uh, as all countries are, but also uh, re regarding the uh, innovation and the uh, intellectual property rights and our other R&D issues uh, related to this. So we, uh, this will be very interesting, and that was one of the reasons we wanted to highlight this issue for everyone, so you have a better understanding of what will be coming up uh, uh, this coming week. Uh, Finally, we'd like to bring up a, 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 a very important issue uh, that uh, uh, all of you are aware of and that uh, we, you will uh, be hearing about uh, in, in years to come, I fear, and that is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, so with us we have uh, Dr. Hanan Bakli, who's the Assistant Director General for Antimicrobial Resistance at WHO. Please, Doctor. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you and uh, with my colleagues. Um, stepping right from a member state into WHO about three weeks ago, I'll, I'll give you my perspective. So it's a bit a mix. Um, well, I think to start with, it's very, very important to understand the issue of AMR in general and what do we mean when we say antimicrobial resistance and what, how is it different than many of the other topics or health topics. Now, being a pediatrician by training and practicing up till a few months back and an infection preventionist and someone who was uh, very heavily involved in my region and with the WHO Collaborating Center addressing IPC and AMR, it's been very exciting in the past three weeks since I arrived in Geneva to see how the WHO has really, uh, or how it does have high ambitions to really change the paradigm on AMR. Um, so the issue of antimicrobial resistance, as our moderator uh, truly said, it's a topic that's gonna be with us for a very long time. Um, the issue of misuse of antibiotics, the misuse whether giving the, right, the wrong dose, the wrong route, the wrong duration, over-treating, under-treating, all these are considered um, improper management of antibiotics, contamination of the environment from pharmaceutical companies, from the, um, pharmacy, from the farmland, from agriculture. Um, use of antimicrobials in the animal, the unintended exposure, if you will. So we're exposed by choice, and we're also expo exposed by, um, by coincidence or by, by accident. So all of these exposures and all of this issue of misuse of antibiotics is really creating a huge challenge for how can we address the issue of AMR. So. If you've been hearing about this topic in a very simplistic way, whether we should improve the production, we always, you always hear this issue of the pipeline is dry, there's no new antimicrobials coming out, that is true. But the topic to be, solu the solution for this problem is really way above and beyond only R&D. It is really an extremely complex matter that needs to be addressed at the level of the human health, animal health, environment, and it really needs the collaboration, implementation, capacity building at the member state, and the engagement at every single level. So the, if you look at some of the diagrams, the beautiful diagrams, one of them came out in the uh, CDC document on AMR, another came in the WHO document, a third one came out in the most recent IACG recommendations, where you see antimicrobials misused and exposing environment and humans and animals and hospitals and households, all these circles of chains, where do you break them? How do you break them? How do you improve hygiene? How do you improve IPC? How do you improve biosecurity at the animal level, at the farm level. All of these elements require really strong collaboration, strong legislation, strong implementation. So coming from that perspective from before I uh, came to the WHO, there were several major steps that were already being done. Uh, apart from addressing these elements in silos, if you will. There was the issue of hand hygiene, which was a big, big movement in 2005. Of course, I'm talking after Semmelweis's initiative ages ago, but the more recent uh, movement of hand hygiene in 2005, followed by the GAP uh, recommendations in 2015, 
followed by the UNGA resolution, which was a major, major step forward in September 2016 and the implementation and the founding of the IECG, which we, by the way, have some copies for you outside, and the uh, finalization of the IECG recommendations, which is the interagency consulting group, if you will, which I was a member on that committee for about two and a half years. So those, those were initial um, uh, initiatives. Uh, apart also from the multiple different elements within WHO, including an AMR secretariat that was addressing the different aspects of AMR, including in our colleagues' group, the uh, Essentials Medicines group, they had, you know, uh, producing the CIA list, the, FO, the uh, Food and Safety group dealing with AGISAR and surveillance issues, the AMR secretariat dealing with national action plans. So there were several entities. So the WHO, after the IEC recommendations and after um, these uh, OECD report that came out and after the Jim O'Neill report that came out, there became a little bit of a hot platform. The issue of AMR became much more hot. We realized that we really need to collaborate. We really need to work together. And the WHO took a major step by creating and initiating a new division, which I'm currently heading, which is the division of AMR. What we would like to do and how we'd like to proceed forward is that we're trying to enhance the work that already has been going on within the WHO and among the different triparts and union and uh, uh, UNDP is also to enhance the accountability part enhancing the uh, promotion, partnership, and you can see the, the details of that in our IECG recommendations, which are under five different categories with a total of uh, 14 recommendations. So my mandate uh, is to work with the, with the different um, elements within WHO. We have a major focus on working with regional offices, enhancing visibility and capacity building with member states, and all of that is going to require a lot of uh, collaboration. Um, you will see within World Health Assembly for this year that the elements that address AMR, and we did a quick uh, analysis, and you can see because of the diversity of this topic, you'll find it in the water and sanitation, you'll find it in patient safety, you'll find it in uh, universal health coverage. So the topic is broad. It requires a really broad um, uh, vision and view, and it really does require a lot of collaboration. So I'll stop here maybe and um, end it by this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Balki. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, when I go to New York for uh, uh, the uh, UN special sessions uh, and high-level meetings on uh, particular issues, I, I ask myself, well, how much is this going to really make a difference? But I did attend that 2016 uh, high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance, and from my perspective, it's really pushed things along, uh, and not only at WHO, but at the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health, and far beyond. It's really uh, uh, moved things forward, and this is a, a very important issue that, because of its diversity that you talked about, is sometimes uh, hard for individuals to grasp, but, but a very important one to be working on. Uh, all right, we've now uh, heard from our speakers, but we really want to open it up to your questions. Uh, so uh, if you could please, uh, we do have uh, two microphones uh, in the audience uh, or, 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 or that to get people to talk uh, and ask their questions uh, into the microphone. If you could please raise your hand um, uh, and we'll be happy to uh, hear from you folks uh, on uh, the, uh, if you have questions of the speakers on any of these issues that we just discussed. Uh, yes, uh, ma'am, uh, the microphone will be um, there. Hi, I'm Billy McCarthy Price. I'm here representing Global Voices. We're a not-for-profit from Australia. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about all of you mentioned the siloed nature of how uh, these different issues are sort of taken apart and addressed. You know, pandemics are a huge national security issue. Like you were saying, antimicrobial micro AMR <laughs> is a huge issue across a diverse range of um, areas. How is the World Health Organization working to break down these silos 
I mentioned before in the previous session that it's really difficult when you're used to operating with, you know, the Department of Health within a nation. Um, you know, what part of the transformation strategy is looking at ways to break down these siloed and increase the nature of how you can improve health for these big, big, wicked issues? Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, two more questions and then I'll ask the panel to answer them. Uh, uh, sir. My question is perhaps more specific to Neil. Uh, my name is Neil, and I am from the United States. Uh, I'm here uh, with the International Federation for Medical Students Associations. Um, I'm actually a veterinary student, though, studying in the Midwest. Um, and a significant topic of my, of my interest and, and my research has been the policy and science behind antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and specifically, um, like you mentioned, the silos the sort of multi-sectoral, I guess, wickedness of that issue. Um, and I'm wondering what you view, and what anyone else here views, as the biggest steps that the United States specifically needs to take, and perhaps from, from the agricultural sector as well within the United States, to improve um, kind of our record and just uh, helping to combat antimicrobial resistance in general. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're, we're trying not to get into specific uh, issues for, per country, but that's. Uh, but actually, there's a lot of things that not only the United States but many other countries can do, uh, and we'll uh, we'll get to that in a minute uh, uh, after one more question. Please, ma'am. Hello. Thank you very much for your input on this panel today. My name's Carrie. I'm also a medical student with the International Federation of Medical Students Association. My question is related to access to medicine specifically. Uh, one of the major challenges that low and middle income countries face in access to medicines is the issues with barriers to purchasing prices, especially for pharmaceuticals that are often at a very high price um, and coming from countries that don't have a large financial budget to be able to afford these. And I was, my question is, what is the role of pooled funds, for example, the PAHO strategic fund, in terms of collaborating between blocks of countries to enable access to medicines, and how much will this appear on the agenda this year? Okay, we've got a question on the access to medicines, a question on antimicrobial resistance, and a question for everyone, actually, in terms of the silos uh, issue. Uh, and uh, having had a career in uh, the United States Department of State, I think uh, 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 I and many others here in the audience are familiar with silos in any bureaucracy, but uh, uh, given the nature of the health issues, uh, one has to break down those silos. Uh, uh, I'll ask any one of you to speak. Uh, see, doctor. I think this is a really very important question, and uh, uh, the way that uh, in WHO we look to the uh, related health security related issue is through the angle of the international health regulation to zona 5. This legally binding tools give us a, a common platform as WHO and member states to work together to ensure high level of health security in the countries. This is in the heart of the uh, emergency country preparedness. And this is why we start first to look, to ask each member state to report on what this member state achieve in terms of implementing the HR every year, and this is what we are going to report to the assembly, in, and based on the, the 13 capacity under the IHR, that you know I'm sure very well, and also in terms of uh, achievement in terms of uh, the assessment of the capacity at the national level. We're also proposing to member states who they would like to have a joint external evaluation activities to go to their countries to assess with them with different partners from outside but also and this is more important from inside to look what is the weaknesses and with the strength into secure health security in this country and with them we come up with the national plan of actions to develop and to strengthen their health security using all hazard approach not only one angle and so far for example we have one hand out of 190 six state parties, uh, almost one, white eight, one eight nine reported on their, 
on their achievement, which is unique this year, much more than the other years. And the quality of the data is really very important that can give us clear idea about the, 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 the preparing of country. We realized that 96 uh, joint evaluation external joint external evaluation with countries, and we come up with almost 60 national plan of action. But here also we have a big uh, gap, uh, or big challenge, how to implement this, 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 this plan of action, because lack of funding. Lack of funding from domestic resources, definitely, but also lack for uh, international community solidarity to implement their, this act, these plans in countries where the, there is no enough uh, domestic resources. And the uh, WHO and the World Bank established a global mechanism to oversee the preparedness, and this is the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, composed of high-level political uh, figures, and to assess, the, to assess not only WHO work, but the, the global preparedness and how member states are prepared, and the global community prepared, and uh, give advice to WHO and partners how to move ahead with this. I think, uh, and uh, Elona is one, is one member of this board, and can she speak about uh, the work of this board much better than I do. But just to, sh to say that we have a horizontal approach across silos, across department, which is the IHR, which is the, the whole work of preparedness, and uh, we do map all the activities in several departments and follow up. For example, uh, antimicrobial resistance in one of the major elements of health security and, and country preparedness, but is not followed by the department that, that I'm running with, followed with Hanan, but we are mapping and reporting on the same for chemical, radionuclear, and other areas. Of course, I cannot deny that there is no silos, but with this approach, we can bring people together, and we have one umbrella that uh, brings us all, all together. Uh, first, I'd like to call on uh, Ranieri, because I, I believe you may have to leave shortly. But uh, uh, the, uh, 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 when you talk about breaking down silos, I believe there are three assistant directors general who have universal health coverage in their title. Uh, so uh, that's uh, maybe an example of trying to break down those silos, but please. Uh, uh, that's basically part of the entire work of the organization. So in a way, you can argue that the entire WHO is around universal coverage, because that's the way we, 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 we try to achieve impact. Uh, three things, and I'll be much shorter than my colleagues. The first is, in, uh, the, the big thing in WHO is planning from the country up to the center and not vice versa. Planning from the country means that we talk about systems. We talk about a sort of integrated view on what matters at the country level. In a way, we are forced to respond and the way we respond is through mobilizing the whole organization at the three different levels, but also within the headquarters from all the different divisions. Um, you may also argue that introducing the terminology of division is not really something that, that resounds good in terms of breaking silos, but that's unfortunately how, how it goes. Um, the second point is that my perception of the risk of continuing with the silos is more on the normative side. The normative side, by definition, takes into consideration specific angles in the system that need regulations, that needs, as it has been said, some, some specific, highly technical perspective on what matters at the country level once again. So our, our engagement with the, the ministers and the colleagues in the ad system responds to that. The big thing though is also the political dimension of health, which is the new, the new discussion within the organization, which is what Tedros has brought into the organization. The political dimension of health is something that we can't really limit to specific angles in the health system. We can't even limit to the health system per se, because whenever we talk about social environmental uh, determinants of health, Whenever we talk about commercial determinants of health and the new issues, which is legal determinants of health, we go into a much broader dimension than what we do. So the level of engagement is not only within the organization, but also outside the organization. The global action plan that you heard about on the SDG3 is indeed focusing on that, bringing in different entities from within the U UN system and beyond to really try to understand what matters and where the big leverage is. 
Thank you. Okay, so I, I have a, I have a, um, I, I think a take which on this, which might look at it from a diff slightly different angle. I think the question, why do silos form? How do you get rid of them at WHO? Is a great question. So I think silos form because they are efficient. Because if you don't include everyone, you can get stuff done faster. It's speedy and it's satisfying. So I think you got to sell inclusiveness. And I think that's what WHO is doing. And I think it's being sold really on two basic ideas. One, that for, uh, you have to have inclusiveness. Inclusiveness buys you credibility in the process. And process credibility buys you outcome legitimacy. And so outcome legitimacy is so, so important because without it, the fact that you do it at WHO doesn't matter because it's just another WHO product. But if it's legitimate, if it's shared, if you take that extra time, you can do it. So I think part of it is an appreciation that uh, process credibility really matters to outcome legitimacy. So that would be my answer. Just to cover the um, access to medicines question, um, pooled procurement is one of, the, one of the key things that we recommend with our cancer pricing report because for industry and governments, volume is everything basically. People, um, if industry can sell larger volumes of medicines, the average price will come down. We deal with small countries where no one responds to their tenders because there's two or three people that have a critical condition. They have to go and purchase the product from somewhere, it's not registered in their country, so they have to work together. We do a lot of things to um, enhance countries' purchasing power, so giving them advice on um, procurement, helping them with negotiation training, how to do negotiations um, with companies. But we even, um, and another great example for getting access for low income countries is the medicines patent pool, which is located here in Geneva, which works with industry to get patents for medicines and make them available in low and some middle income countries at a cost price plus um, some sort of um, royalty for the company. And that's a great way of making access available. But still, um, we need to work with uh, uh, not just the um, people that are purchasing the medicines, but we need to work with our health financing colleagues to make sure there's money available to um, buy the medicine. So it's a multifaceted problem which inherently breaks down the silos because we have to work with everyone to solve the problem. Working together um, is not limited to low-income countries as well. We've seen examples of the Beneluxa group, which is Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg and Austria and now Ireland that are working together to try and get, um, because they're having trouble affording high cost medicines. So it's not just limited to low income countries. Uh, thank you, I think I'll, I'll take a stab at both questions. With regards to the silos, I think the, the, first, the first step is to acknowledge that there are silos. And I think that we're beyond that, which is really great because once you know that there are silos and you've sensed the, um, the disjointment in the system when you come to a member state. Um, and I sat on the JEE that uh, Jawad was talking about when I was back home, and it was really a bit daunting to see how um, the people in the room responding to the teams coming to the to the country, how they're, you know, the, some of them, you know, the veterinarians would, would be totally zoned out. They're, they have no idea what's going on. Some of the people in the health sector, they're more engaged than others. So, so knowing that the impact at the end, what we're saying that de gets developed at headquarters or regional offices, if it's not put together in a cohesive package, if it's not given to a country in a way that is usable for them, it gets lost. And I've seen that in front of my eyes. So in, in my first days, as we're putting our work together and as we're trying to identify, and we've already did that in the past uh, two weeks, the areas that are relevant to AMR, we're already having joint meetings. We're already trying to consolidate the work that we're going to work with it. Again, my area, AMR, when I serve IPC, when I serve uh, appropriate use, by default, I'm serving emergency preparedness. We're, we're improving capacity within countries. So again, acknowledging the silos exist. Number two, getting uh, beyond our egos. And I, I could not agree more with Stephen, but I think in what I see, and I may be right or may be wrong, but it's the issue of funding as well. 
So if I have a lot of money in AMR, I'm really not going to want to share it with anybody. But if I find Jawad has a lot of money, I want to be part of his, <laughs> his work. So I think also knowing that the accountability and, and, and the outcome at the end of the day, member states and humanity and healthcare and all, it doesn't matter. So, so we're, we're there, I hope. With regards to the question of, uh, again, I, I thank you, John, for getting me out of that predicament, so I will respond for a country, not for specifically for the US, because I'm not uh, an expert uh, from the US. But I think when we did discuss this a lot about, so we talked about within the healthcare sector itself, there was silos, there's disjointment and all of that. But again, AMR, you're talking about now, um, you know, uh, f food drug administrations, you're talking about uh, health, uh, agriculture, water, sanitation, all of these. W one of the things that were part of the, the, the national action plans is awareness. So if you talk to a pharmacist, uh, to a veterinarian who's giving products to their animals to make them healthier and you ask them what's in this product, they'll tell you, I don't know what's in that product. And you'll find hormones, you'll find antibiotics, you'll find all kinds of things. As well, why are they giving antibiotics? Why do they have to pour so much antibiotics in the fish industry or in, in some of the um, uh, terrestrial animal in uh, agriculture? The economy issue is a big issue. Um, and then acknowledging that if you do enhance hygiene in the animal sector, you can use less antibiotics or you can use them for intended therapy and not prevention. So awareness, capacity building, increasing the biosecurity, again, um, being aware of where are the gaps that are pushing us, whether because of economical reasons or others, to use antibiotics um, in, in, a, in, a, in a negative way. So um, there's a lot that needs to be done in that, in that uh, aspect. Um, contamination of the environment is a big issue. Um, many countries suffer from open defecation systems. How do you improve, again, going back to universal health coverage, health care systems, the systems, we have to look at AMR from a systems perspective. Um, and there's a lot that needs to be done. The issue with AMR, again, if you do not solve it, and you cannot solve it 100%, but if you, if you only be selective in improving AMR, the globe is now living in a very small community traveling, um, interaction between communities and cultures, these bugs will be traveling around and they will cause problems in places where they have not originated in but have traveled to. Um, so I think those are just some of my thoughts at a very early stage. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much and um, um, you, uh, you're very knowledgeable for three weeks on the job, I have to say. This is very good. <laughs> the, <laughs> impressive. Uh, we, we've talked about uh, pathogens and bugs and emergencies and uh, 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 viruses and all kinds of things that today and, and, and what I think has been a quite interesting discussion. We want to be respectful of your time, so uh, we'll have to close the session at this point uh, for the uh, closing remarks from Alona and me, but I want to uh, thank our panel for what I think was a very productive and informative session. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we, we really appreciate this. Um, uh, quiet, if we could please have quiet, uh, uh, just a few closing remarks from Alona and me. Um, at the United Nations Foundation, we uh, help the UN and its agencies to mobilize ideas, people, and resources that are necessary to drive progress and uh, tackle urgent challenges. I, I think this is a good example today where we really uh, uh, helped to bring this about with uh, 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 the, our hosts, uh, the, uh, the Global Health Center here at the Graduate Institute, uh, to really mobilize ideas and people. Uh, and uh, one hopes that with this will come some resources. But uh, from our perspective, this was a really informative session uh, that uh, uh, was uh, uh, a, a very thoughtful discussion of the WHO transformation. 
And then uh, we, it, we really tried to give you, and I think we succeeded in, in uh, bringing you uh, specific information on really some of the key issues that you'll be hearing about this coming week. Uh, there are other key issues out there. We don't want to uh, minimize the importance of those, but uh, the ones that you heard about today will be some of the most prominent ones during the coming weeks. So uh, thank you all for coming. We are very pleased that, uh, uh, that you were able to attend and to stay with us. And now I'll turn it over to Alona. Thank you very much, John, for the cooperation. Again, I'd like to say a big thanks to the Global Health Center team for putting this together. I've looked at the tweets, and already some people are commenting on the gender composition of the last panel. I can, uh, could invite Michaela to talk to you for a quarter of an hour uh, for how she tried to influence this. Uh, we are very, very aware of this. At the same time, that's just how it goes when uh, WHO responsible people uh, you know, have many different meetings to go to. And we were still uh, very pleased that uh, we got uh, representation at a very high level of the WHO. You will see we had a number of assistant director generals which shows that they are taking this briefing very, very seriously. Uh, so uh, tongue in cheek, I did say in one of my response tweets, maybe the important women were at more important meetings. Uh, and uh, yes, we had invited uh, uh, one or two of the really top women of WHO. But I think that is real life. I think the important thing is to have a clear awareness of it, to try and do it. Next time, what we'll do, a very uh, innovative concept was to have the mics handed out, not by young women, but by older gentlemen. Uh, so uh, we'll see how we can work on that and how we select those older gentlemen. Uh, we'll find a way to do it. But anyhow, thank you very much for coming. I hope it was useful. Uh, we, as John said, we try and uh, select some key issues, have one panel that is of uh, high importance, and uh, we hope to see many of you back here this next year and have a fantastic World Health Assembly Week and change the world. Thank you. <laughs>